Uh, welcome everyone to BIM Security's third corporate day of the year. Uh, today, uh, we will bringing you the uh, uh, the economics uh, corporate day. Uh, as you can see uh, from the line up, we have a very uh, respectable uh, speaker today uh, that will begin with uh, Professor Chandran Govindaraju, which is the acting dean and business economics faculty of University of Malaya. He will be talking about industry challenges and outlook. Uh, this will take you about one and a half hours. This will be followed by uh, Datuk Professor Ulung Dr. Rajah Rasia, which is the executive director uh, of uh, Asia Europe Institute uh, of University of Malaya. Um, note that uh, Professor Raja, uh, Datuk Professor Ulung Ra Dr. Raja, uh, if you recall, a few weeks ago, he was appointed as the advisor, economic advisor of the government uh, for the government alongside with uh, Tan Sri uh, Hassan American. So both will be able to give some insight on what we, what uh, should we uh, expect economic wise uh, in the near term. Uh, just a sh short note on the program itinerary. Uh, program itinerary uh, will begin with will begin at 9:30, and then. Uh, uh, there will be opening a uh, speech later, and then uh, there will be uh, economic presentation by our chief economist, which is Encik Imran, and then followed one and a half hours each by all the speakers. Uh, just some uh, housekeeping uh, housekeeping uh, note: uh, this is uh, this event is a uh, Securities Commission uh, accredited program uh, for those that uh, have a, a license. Uh, you uh, are, are expected to stay about three and a half hours uh, to qualify for the 10 CPE point. Uh, to be qualified, uh, note that uh, please ensure that you have completed the pre-assessment and CPE seminar form before the event start. Uh, and you are required to remain logged in for the entire session. Uh, note that uh, as per SC requirement, uh, you are reminded to stay in the program as this will be recorded uh, for your time in and out of the system. Uh, this will be need to be submitted to SC for you to qualify for the 10, 10 CPE point. Once you complete the, uh, you are also uh, required to do the post assessment after the session ends. Uh, note that the post assessment will be open for, at 12 p.m will be closed within a week after the session or webinar, which is on the 23rd of March. Uh, note that all the learning material will be uploaded uh, in the learning platform. Uh, for those who register for learning hours, kindly scan the QR code, which will be shared later uh, at the end of the session for attendance, attendance and course evaluation. Should you face any uh, difficulty or any uh, challenges regarding the seminar, ma the BIMB Securities Research Team, uh, Working Team is on standby to address all your, uh, what you call, challenges. Uh, the numbers will be flashed later uh, for you to contact us, particularly with those regarding the CPE points, uh, uh, because uh, we need the, all the information, especially on the, uh, the license and whatnot. So, uh, be, uh, without further ado, uh, we would like to call... Um, Encik Azim Faris uh, to, uh, to, uh, to perform a doa for us uh, to actually seek the, uh, Allah blessing for uh, the, the, what do you call, uh, for our session uh, to be uh, smooth and graced by Allah, inshallah. Uh, Azim, uh, over to you. Al-Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم إنا نسألك لسانا رتبا بذكرك وقلبا مفعما بشكرك وبددا حينا لينا بطاعتك اللهم إنا نسألك إيمانا كاملا ونسألك قلبا خاشعا ونسألك علما نافعا 
ونسألك يقينا صادقا ونسألك دينا قيما ونسألك العافية من كل بلية ونسألك تمام الغنى عن الناس وهب لنا حقيقة الإيمان بك حتى لا نخاف ولا نرجو غيرك ولا نعبد شيئا سواك اجعل يدك مبسوطة علينا وعلى أهلنا وأولادنا ومن معنا لرحمتك لا تكلنا إلا أنفسنا طرفة عين ولا أقل من ذلك وأن يعمل مدين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين Alhamdulillah Thank you Azim uh, for the doa uh, Before uh, we move on to the speakers uh, let us from BNB Securities give a speech uh, an opening speech My name is uh, Dr. Nani I am the Head of Research of BNB Securities uh, Welcome again to our event Now it is uh, definitely a challenging time for the global economy in Malaysia per se uh, particularly with the recent uh, development from the US the banking crisis uh, it, I, I'm sure you are aware of the banking crisis um, uh, especially with the uh, involve, uh, with the um, the effect uh, negative effect for uh, signature bank uh, and also Credit Suisse and also Silicon Valley Bank. So will they, will this be an effect to Malaysia? Uh, there could be an effect to Malaysia, especially given the rapid capital, uh, uh, the rapid capital outflow as a result. And we see how the equity market or BM KCL was actually affected for the last few days because of the current crisis. And um, the two speakers will be able to give some insight on what should we expect going forward on the economy, particularly after we uh, recover from COVID-19. Of course, COVID-19 uh, still, uh, what you call, uh, has left uh, a lot of, uh, what you call, imprint in our economy. Uh, not that um, the services sector have yet to come to a full turnaround this year. Uh, coincidentally is going to be our full year impact of economic uh, reopening recall that the economy was uh, fully reopened only on the first March of last year so we would like to see uh, what you what would be uh, uh, ahead of us uh, economic wise and Particularly after the GDP of last year that reached 8.7% year-on-year, will this 4.5% uh, uh, forecast by MOF uh, really sustainable? Uh, Doctor, pro both speakers will be able to give you what they think uh, should we expect not only this year but also going to be uh, the following year, uh, the following and the following year. Particularly when Malaysia is set to actually open their door uh, for visit Malaysia year 2025. So. Uh, other than that, what will be uh, the challenges for Malaysia, particularly when Dr. Chandran will be speaking on related on the sector wise, uh, we know that certain sectors are still facing with uh, labor uh, shortage issue, uh, plantation, manufacturing services and unemployment uh, currently, could it be even lower than that? How about job creation? How about wages? Uh, how about uh, what you call the sustainability of our, us to able to create employment? Will the government, uh, what you call, uh, go for pump premium? What will be uh, the option of the government? Uh, let's say that they're going to go for pump prime. Will we have enough? Uh, we, will we have enough in our uh, coffers to actually go for big, uh, big construction project to boost the economy? What will be the impact to uh, private consumption, to domestic demand as a result of challenging that, uh, challenges that we have? Now, uh, the challenges of the, the, the global economy in Malaysia per se is actually abundant, eh? particularly with the geopolitical tension in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, if you are not aware, we just issue uh, what you call a thematic report on uh, the prolonged impact of the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis, what will be the impact to our economy, and then the Straits of Taiwan, uh, the geopolitical Straits, in Taiwan, uh, Straits of Taiwan, and what will be the impact, what you call uh, other uh, tension in the in the global economy, the supply demand imbalance, uh, the supply demand imbalance, and then uh, the US, particularly the 
uh, the increase in the US interest rate? Will there be an increase in US interest rate next week? Uh, will will they continue increasing interest rate despite the fact that uh, there is a banking crisis in the US at the moment? Will it be 25 basis points? Will it be 50 basis points? Uh, so all these are actually what you call uh, real issues that we need to get from the expert to give their view on what we think uh, should we factor in into our investing decision. Uh, particularly when the US interest rate increase or the policy decision is very close, which is next week on the 22nd of March. Eh? So, and then uh, followed by 22nd of March, followed by uh, May policy decision. We know that the current US, uh, what do you call, uh, US interest rate is already, already reaching their neutral rate. Will they go, remain on the rise to reach their terminal rate. So all these are actually real issues uh, facing us. Yeah? Now, again, uh, we are particularly concerned on the banking crisis uh, in the US. Uh, we know that uh, what you call uh, among all the crises, whether, opening. whether whether the banking crisis, the currency crisis, banking crisis, actually the one that have a large impact on the economy. Yeah? Uh, so that is something that we have to be very vigilant. Uh, we know that one one, it will take. It need to take only one banking, uh, banking bus, uh, banking, uh, banking, uh, what they call the the one bank to bus is enough to actually others impact to the rest of the, uh, banking sector. Uh, why is it? Because banking sector is the heartbeat of the economy. Uh, they provide uh, not only working capital for all the companies, for all the companies, but also letter of credit, liquidity, financing. So that's why uh, the current situation uh, presents us uh, a very opp opportune time for us to speak to uh, the expert, which is Professor uh, Chandran and Dr. Professor Ulung Raja. Eh? I hope that everyone will be able uh, to uh, ask uh, Pressing question, uh, pressing question, burning question for all, the, for both uh, professors. If you uh, have any question, um, you can either ask uh, verbally uh, both professors or you can put it into the chat box. Uh, my team will be able to read it out uh, for both professors. Now, both professors will be speaking for about one hour and we will uh, open the floor uh, for half an hour uh, for everyone to actually ask questions uh, regarding the um, on the economic side. I mean, uh, Professor Chandran, his exp expertise is actually on the sector related. Uh, you can ask about manufacturing, the slowdown in the manufacturing sector. Is it possible that the services sector will be able to rebound by double digit this year, what uh, he thinks on the plantation sector, all these are key, key sectors, uh, uh, key sectors in our economy, mining wise, uh, what he thinks uh, should we expect, uh, will, be, will we be able to sustain uh, our mining sector growth as what we saw in the IPI. Uh, recently. Okay, without uh, taking much of our time, we welcome everyone uh, to this, um, our, to our third corporate day of the year. And we hope you can gain so much from this. Uh, line up two respectable speakers line up and then do ask a lot of questions, uh, particularly when the, there is a current banking crisis uh, in the US. So we will uh, use their expertise to actually get uh, some insight from them to actually help you uh, to get for informed investing uh, decision. Without uh, further taking the time, uh, uh, let's uh, hear uh, from Enchi Imran, our Chief Economist of BNB Securities, uh, a few words um, from local and also global economy, uh, what we have inside for you uh, this year and also uh, next year. Okay, Imran, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nani. Okay, Assalamualaikum and very good morning to everybody. Okay, uh, I'll be talking about the global economy as well as Malaysia economy. And uh, last year was a plentiful turbulence and the ride has been very bumpy. And as we move into 2023, I think the predicament of a continued fight against inflation and trust towards economic growth is likely uh, irresolvable in the near term. And uh, 
I think the global fight against inflation, Russia's war in Ukraine and a resurgence of COVID-19 in China uh, weigh on the global economic activity in 2022 and the first two factors which is uh, inflation and Russia's war in Ukraine I think we continue to do so in 2023 uh, hence I think the global economy is poised to slow this year before rebounding next year and but despite these headwinds the outlook is less gloomy and could represent a turning point with growth bottoming out and inflation uh, declining uh, I think uh, economic growth proved surprisingly resilient in the third quarter of last year with a strong labor market, robust uh, household consumption and business investment and better expected adaptation to the energy crisis in Europe. And inflation too showed improvement with overall measures now decreasing in most countries even if core inflation which uh, excludes more volatile energy and food prices has yet to peak in uh, many countries. In the fourth quarter of last year, uh, this uptick faded and in most, uh, in most though not all major economies. So overall the economy moderated, uh, the global GDP moderated uh, to 3.4% and reflecting the economic slowdown in advanced economies as well as emerging market and developing economies. And uh, as for Malaysia, despite the softened global growth, uh, the economy recorded a strong growth of 8.7% in 2022 and it was driven by domestic demand and improved labour market uh, in line with the transition to the endemic uh, phase and uh, subsequently encouraging such, uh, expansion in all economic sectors but, uh, primarily the services and manufacturing have also provided continuous impetus to the significant growth uh, in 2022. And for 2023, global growth is expected to uh, to further soften to 2.6% on, on the back of the persistent pressures such as inflation, tightening global financial conditions and economic deceleration among major economies. And uh, Malaysia economic growth is projected to moderate to 4.5% amid the signs of uh, weakness in the global growth momentum. Uh, elsewhere, we see that China's sudden reopening paved the way for a rapid rebound in economic activity and I think that global economy would benefit from the end of uh, China's zero COVID policy thanks to the strengthened uh, exports and also tourism but still I think the positive from China's economic recovery uh, would be weaker than in the past. In the next slide we see that uh, global economic forecast uh, from IMF, World Bank and the OECD. The IMF in their uh, World Economic Outlook released in January this year uh, said that global economy uh, expanded by 3.4% in 2022 uh, and for 2023 they expect uh, uh, global economy to grow by 2.9% and the OCD said that the outlook for the world is slightly brighter at the beginning of 2023 than what had been uh, uh, thought just uh, two, two, three months ago. And the OCD also said that the global economy is predicted to grow well below the uh, expect, uh, outcome expected before the war at a modest 3.1% in 2022, before slowing to 2.2% in 2023. And the World Bank, uh, expect the global growth to grow by 1.7% in 2023 from 2.9% in 2022. So I think overall, the global economic outlook is slightly brighter this year, but inflation challenges remain and global economic outlook is set to be weaker uh, in 2023 with the main driving force being the monetary policy tightening led by the US Federal Reserve and major central banks to tame uh, their uh, high inflation. But overall, we do not uh, expect a severe recession due to the absence of uh, financial imbalances. And I think uh, if you look at uh, what the one the main issue that we faced last year was the uh, supply chain. And, in the, and uh, this slide basically shows the Federal Reserve Bank of New York Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. Uh, we call it GCSPI and it's a global measure designed to capture supply chain disruptions using a range of uh, 
uh, uh, indicators. Okay, yeah. The GSPCI peaked at 4.3 standard deviation above its historical mean at the end of 2021. And uh, the initial period of decline saw it drop by, uh, it dropped to 2.8 uh, by March 2022. And after which it temporarily increased in April only due to uh, pandemic lockdown in China and the Russian-Ukraine war. The index then experienced five consecutive months of declines reaching a low of 0 0.9 in September. But in the last uh, three, three months of 2022, uh, we saw we witness, uh, uh, we, we witnessed a pause in the revision of the to the historical average with the index increasing to uh, by a total of about 0 0.3 points in October and November. And I think uh, the global supply chains have returned to normal with prices dropping to the lowest since before the COVID-19, uh, which uh, through a range into the procurement networks worldwide and created shortages for everything from microchips to motor vehicles. And uh, the New York Fed monthly GES CPI fell to negative 0 0.26 in February down from a reverse 0 0.94 seen in uh, January. So I think uh, the negative turn for February, which indicates prices are below the index, uh, is historic norm dating from 1998, was the first six August 2019. So uh, the supply chain bottlenecks that have dogged the global economy for roughly about three years uh, have finally been unplugged with the latest improvements occurring after China and its COVID-19 restrictions at the end of last year. So what we are facing now is uh, inflation and uh, what has started as the supply disruptions and cost of inflation have burdened to other goods and services. And uh, we look at the data suggests that global inflation peaked in 2022 after hitting the highest level in four decades. Prices of fuel and non-fuel commodities have declined, lowering headline inflation, uh, especially in the US and the euro area. But the underlying, which is a core inflation, has not yet peaked in most economies and remain uh, well above the pre-pandemic levels. The latest data show US uh, inflation is to 0.4% month on month, but headline, uh, uh, but the core CPI is related to by 0.5% month on month. And the year on year rates slowed to 6% from 6.5%. And for core inflation, uh, it was 5.5%. Uh, Eurozone CPI also uh, slowed to 8.6% in January, and UK inflation rate uh, remained close to 40 year high to hit 10.9%. Uh, uh, domestically, Malaysia uh, headline uh, inflation is rated for the fifth three month 3.7% year on year from 38 percent in December. Uh, the lowest reading in uh, since June 2022. And given that all this uh, uh, inflation, which is still uh, elevated, I think uh, we, what we saw last year was, is where all, almost all global central banks hiked interest rates faster and higher in 2022, hardening their resolve to bring down inflation as well as uh, anchor inflation expectations. And I think we inflation likely to remain high for some time, despite global energy and food prices softening in recent months and sharp easing in supply chain pressures in consumer good, uh, markets. A pivot back towards an interest rate cut uh, at the moment is uh, still unlikely. And but uh, I think the quantum of interest rate high will be smaller compared to steep uh, hikes at the beginning of the rate tightening cycle. And uh, we we saw that central banks uh, all over the world, like Fed, BOE, and I, ECB, had continued with their uh, interest rate hike uh, this year. But uh, we saw like last uh, last month, for example, US increased the benchmark, uh, benchmark overnight rate by twenty five basis point, taking it into four point five to four point seven five. And uh, but uh, with economic data largely surprising to the outside at the start of the year, Fed officials uh, look uh, a bit hawkish in recent weeks, and this sentiment was echoed by the uh, Fed chair in his joint testimony to Congress. Uh, I think last week, where he hinted at rates needing to go higher and possibly 
faster over the coming months. But in the span of few days, the Fed decision has become enormously complicated. Uh, where, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Nani just now, two notable banks have blown up in the past week uh, about a turmoil that is partly the result of high interest rates. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the, at the end of last week, followed by the uh, seizure of the signature bank uh, just uh, this later. So, basically, I think the recent flow of economic data, data continues to point to an economy that can certainly support for the increase in the interest rate. But uh, I think uh, whether the fact we continue with the interest rate is all depends on uh, their decision and it has been gotten more difficult with the recent bank failures. But I think uh, the fact we continue to raise interest rates to cool the economy and take the edge of the inflation. And uh, if you look at the USD, uh, I think last year USD has streamrolled uh, every other major currency capitalizing on perfect storm of widening interest rate differentials, safe haven flows and, and absence of uh, attractive alternative. And looking at this year, this wave of USD strength could persist early on but perhaps reverse later in the year. And what we saw the last year USD strengthened but from mid November last year, USD weakened against most major currencies and we see uh, in the chart, in the middle chart where by middle of uh, early, early, by early February, almost all major currencies had strengthened against the USD. But uh, underpinned by the rising interest rates, the USD wrap up February on high note. And on the month, the dollar index rose for the first time in five months by about 2.8% to about 105.7. And subsequently, all currencies pulled back against the dollar amidst deteriorating risk sentiment. And that's what we see in the in the third uh, uh, chart where all currencies had uh, weakened against the USD. As for the ringgit, it reached uh, 47480 in November last year, but strengthened to end the year at 440 and it reached 4 to 470 in early february but similar to other currencies the ringgit weakened during the month and fell to about 452 53 last week uh i think uh what we seen in the currency market where ringgit strengthened against the usd for us i think uh we are not too quick just yet to call a downward direction for the dollar ringgit pair as we stay cautious on the Fed rate path trajectory and we continue to maintain a cautiously positive outlook for the ringgit even amid the sharp climb in the dollar ringgit pair in the last few months. So I think uh, there's a virtually no place to hide across the region and the global economy faces an array of challenges to grow. Uh, I think the economic challenges that dominated 2022 which is uh, elevated uh, inflation, tightening financial conditions, energy disruptions, weakening growth in China would not vanish overnight. And overall, the risk to the outlook remains tilted to the downside, even if adverse risks have moderated since October and some positive factors uh, gain in relevance. So overall, on the downside, I think the China's recovery could uh, again uh, play an important uh, role uh, in the global economic growth. And inflation could remain stubbornly high amid uh, continued labor market tightness and growing wage pressures requiring tighter monetary policies and resulting a uh, sharper slowdown in activity. Geopolitical risk uh, is another uh, risk to the uh, global growth. And uh, the recent Sudden repricing on in financial market, for instance, the response to adverse inflation surprise could tighten financial conditions, especially in the uh, emerging and also developing economies. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the Fed aggressive monetary tightening has claimed its first uh, victims, Silicon Valley Bank and also New York Signature Bank, putting uh, the American financial stability at stake. And the news of a uh, magic credit Swiss shareholder ruling out capital injection in the uh, ailing Swiss bank not only rekindled a uh, still injuring fire. It, uh, for me, I think it fell into an uh, roaring blaze. 
and invest investors are running towards the exit concern about a potential collapse and the repercussions of this systematically important bank on the broader financial system. But uh, nevertheless, but being stressed in the banking system is the first sign of the economy injecting two way risk into outlook uh, for the Fed policy. And I think without the Swiss, uh, without the Silicon Valley Bank, the back of the Fed almost attempted to hide another basis point. But now I think policy, policy makers will have to take financial stability risk into consideration, possibly slowing down the Fed, uh, future pace and scale of tightening. And for now, we are not jump, uh, immediately jumping to the conclusion that the banking financial crisis will have broader contagion risk or it, uh, or if it represents a wide systematic issue of the sector, but we are not thinking just yet the Fed would take a step back on its battle against inflation. And uh, another risk is on the COVID-19. I think although COVID no longer exerts a significant economic impact, but the big risk is if it, if a more virulent and contagious COVID strain emerged, which is not uh, effectively checked by the vaccines. So, I think uh, if we, uh, short one on the nation economy, as mentioned, we expect, uh, we project 2023 GDP growth of 4.5% from 8.7%, driven by full turnaround in services and mining sector. And headline inflation rates, uh, if I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, it is marginally to 3.7% year on year in January, and core inflation also is slightly. And at the moment, we are maintaining our forecast, uh, CPF forecast at 3.4% mainly on this effect and amid uh, indication from the retail budget 2023 that few subsidies stays for the time being or the inflation risk remains biased to the upside amid the still free policy of price subsidies and controls as per the plan to float the chicken and also eggs prices uh, in July this year. Meanwhile, uh, Ben Negara maintained the OPR at 2.75 in the second monetary policy meeting uh, this month uh, as uh, the central bank opted to weigh the impact of a previous interest rate increase on economic activity. And I think uh, uh, we believe that there's a room for Benegara to increase another by another 20 basis point, but for now it all depends on uh, the situation and event uh, that is happening in uh, in the US and uh, globally. So uh, there's a there's a chance that central banks might increase, but I don't believe that it will be done in the first half of this year so this is the possibility that it will be it will be done in the second half in july so but it all depends on uh, how uh, things uh, happen in the next few months so i think to conclude it's going to be a tough year for the perspective of uh, global growth and i think uh, the global growth is slowing down in 2023, but a modest bounce back in 20, uh, and we expect a modest bounce back in 2024. So I think uh, that is a brief uh, presentation from me on the global and um, national economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. Uh, thank you, Imran, for that presentation. Uh, we are we uh, we are in line in many things, uh, meaning. Uh, the fact that uh, the current situation is rapidly evolving. Uh, I still remember uh, during Brexit uh, uh, in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, Bank Negara swiftly uh, cut the OPR by 25 basis points uh, in response to the Brexit, Brexit decision. Uh. So considering that fact, uh, whether Bank Negara will increase the OPR in the May, uh, the next policy meeting is in May, it depends largely on the currently rapidly evolving situation which is the banking crisis in the US. Uh, perhaps there could be, um, they could, you know, uh, maintain the OPR to tight us against uh, what they call uh, the current banking crisis just to make sure that uh, the shape is steady. So on that score, uh, before we move on uh, to the next speaker, which is Professor uh, Chandran, 
uh, we are preparing uh, or the technicalities for him, uh, there's some announcement. If uh, if anyone uh, is actually facing a technical issues, audio and whatnot, uh, you can see in the chat box uh, for the phone number that you can call, uh, which is my team is on, on standby to address all your issues. Or you can email as well. The email address is there. Uh, but on the quick fix, you um on the quick fix you can uh, uh you can keluar balik and masuk balik register balik. Uh, sometimes the 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 apa tu, it will be more stable for you whether uh audio or whatnot. So you sometimes it works that way. Otherwise, uh kalau persis juga you can continue. Uh, you can call my team. Uh, just announcement 2613-1741. Uh, the phone number is actually flashed in the chat box. Uh, Imran, is the, Dr. Chandran ready? Imran? Yeah, should be. Yeah, okay. Should be, okay. Uh, briefly, uh, Professor Chandran is currently uh, the acting dean uh, in the UN Economics Department. Uh, he is the professor of industrial development. Uh, he he also has worked as a principal analyst of economics and policy with uh, MIT. Uh, his research interests are mainly innovation, technology, trade and globalization that relate to industrial development. Uh, so perhaps we can ask some burning question with him uh, regarding our trade momentum that it was so strong last year at double digit. So is it sustainable for this year? Uh, he received uh, his uh, degree and also master's in UKM. And he received his PhD uh, from UM in 2010. Uh, without uh, further ado, uh, we hope that uh, Dr. Chandran is uh, the other side in the lobby waiting. And we, pl we pass the floor to him. Uh, Dr. Chandran, thank you for yeah, having us. You. Yes, you can continue. Clearly, thank you. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yes, clearly. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my presentation slide. I hope that uh, the presentation is visible for you. Uh, it's loading at the moment. Okay. Uh, okay, doctor. Oh, oh the okay. floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, my name is Chandran. So, um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to give this presentation to uh, quite a big audience today. Um, let me put the uh, expectation right before I start the presentation. So my area of expertise is basically on industrial development. So what I will be doing today is basically to look into uh, the challenges that Malaysia is facing in terms of positioning the industrial development as an engine approach. Uh, given that um, these challenges have been there for some time and we need to address some of the fundamental issues uh, for us to ensure that we have a long term sustainability in that nature. Um, of, of course, there are a lot of uh, short-term shocks within the economy, uh, external shocks that we have, which uh, Dr. Nani and also Inche Imran has talked about just now, including the uh, current, the recent collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and also the Signature Bank, uh, and whether that will impact the economy worldwide. Yeah, but my 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 concern is more on how do we sustain a longer-term growth, uh, and that relates to how do we position the industrial development um, of the country. So it means uh, how do we position the industrial sectors to move forward uh, because we have a lot of new challenges which is coming in, which is taking place. And challenges wise, we have multiple challenges right now for us to maneuver so that we can position the long-term economic growth in a better trajectory than compared to what we have now. So uh, with, with that in mind, so what I'm going to do next is basically to uh, present some of the a quick uh, foundation or basis on the macroeconomic outlook. I think Imran has talked about it in detail, uh, but um, I'm going to put this in context so that I can relate this to uh, the industrial development progress that we are experiencing now and how do we move on in terms of addressing some of these structural changes that we have. Um, so we have to somehow make some structural transformation uh, within the industrial sector so that we can sustain a better economy uh, growth uh, for the nation. And uh, I will be talking about a bit on the new industrial trends, which requires different types of policies and different types of responses from the policymakers as well as from the industry itself 
uh, in order for them to take the opportunity uh, in uh, at hand uh, so that they can move forward in terms of uh, expanding the market as well as expanding the businesses overall. And also um, the, the key challenges that we will be facing in the near future uh, where it is very important for us to address that uh, now itself so that we can move forward. And when we talk about uh, forecasting the GDP growth and so forth, uh, now it is increasingly becoming a short cycle where you have more you know, downturns uh, in a very short period of time uh, due to uh, economy uncertainties and volatility in the market itself. So in, in, that, in that regard, it is very important for, for us to understand how institutions and policies can make a difference. In most cases, um, what, what I find is that many of the economists are only discussing about the issue of how do we respond to certain shocks. But uh, what is more important is how those policies are being crafted for us to respond to the shocks so that we can have more effective forecasting of the GDP. And modeling policy response within the context of GDP forecasting is quite, uh, it's quite difficult and it requires a lot of information. So if you rightly know what would be the next move of the government say so, and if you have a lot of insight and information with regards to say the policy framework or the institutional framework they have to address certain challenges they, that we have, and when we have more information about this, then we can impute those information in terms of forecasting about the GDP growth uh, for the nation as, as, as well as as well. Yeah. So it's all about information asymmetry that we have, and if you don't have adequate in insight on that, then it's very difficult for us to move forward. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about a bit on the role of institution policies and how that is very important for us to change, uh, so that we can address some of the critical issues. The structural issues that we have within the industrial sectors, yeah? and then at the end, I will conclude um, the presentation. Yeah. So as what um, Mr. Imran have talked about, um, what we are expecting out of the global economy is that we are expecting a deceleration in 2023. So um, the uh, important agencies like World Bank and IMF and also OECD have predicted that there will be slowdown in a global economy activities here. So obviously this is going to affect the, the way that we are going to perform uh, in terms of our own prediction of GDP in that sense. Yeah. But for now, there's no concrete evidence of you know, predicting a recession. Uh, there's a mixed kind of opinion between economists uh, looking into whether we will go into recession or even the whole economy will go into recession and so forth. Uh, and this partly also uh, relates to how policy are going to respond in the next few few months. Uh, so if there's a better policy uh, prescri prescription to address some of these issues, the structural issues in the global economy, as well as in Malaysia, then I think uh, we can avoid this to some extent. So the belief is that in the US, um, the Fed will be able to maintain the momentum in terms of avoiding recession uh, at a larger extent. So in that, in that case, uh, for now, we are not really predicting a recession in that such um, short time. Yeah? Uh, but um, we pose another risk um, that is, uh, we are in the very difficult dilemma right now. And number one is because of the increasing price. Uh, there's a sharp increase in prices around the world. Uh, so, and with the anticipation that we'll have a slower growth, then we have a risk of stagnation uh, or stagflation in, this, in that context, right? So that would be something that we need to look into and then see how we can manage that. So I'm sure that central bank will be very cautious in terms of their next move to whether to increase OPR and so forth, uh, because with a slow economic growth and with a higher, say, uh, if they don't control inflation in that manner, uh, then there will be a risk of the creation, right? So that that would be something that we need to look into, um, and that obviously has implication for Malaysia itself. Right. So um, the 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 recent event on the collapse of Silicon Valley banks and signature bank, um, I think the U.S. Uh, U.S. regulators have come up with some prescription or policy. Uh, where they have guaranteed the uh, depositors' uh, uh, loans, 
so in, in, in that context, I think um, they are trying to push up those impact, uh, the contingency impact on the other economy and so forth. Yeah. Uh, for Malaysia, I, I believe I, I did not look at the data per, per se, uh, but I believe that um, the impact will be much smaller uh, than what um, some of them are predicting. Uh, because uh, the reason being that um, we are not as aggressive as the US in terms of hiking the interest rate, so we are very cautious in that in that context. And number two is that the um, the structure of our portfolio in Malaysia, we have to look into those those flows. To see how much exposure do we have uh, with the with the context of the uh, bond market, for instance, right? So that kind of exposure assessment will give us a more a brighter picture in terms of how uh, what is the size like and what is the implication of that collapse of the bank uh, to us. Yeah, but obviously, what is going to be affected is the um, the innovation nature of the economy itself. Yeah, see, if you look at the U.S., uh, the U.S. is driven by an innovation economy. Um, so that um, new innovation in terms of product or services are going to be impacted uh, because of this uh, financial um, um, challenges that they have currently. Yeah. So, so in in that perspective, certain sectors uh, within Malaysia will be also be affected. Yeah. So like semiconductor, semiconductor has been a very critical sector for Malaysia because it contributes um, quite a big portion in terms of exportation. And even right now, what is happening within the semiconductor industry is that um, we have uh, produced, overproduced, and there's a lot of inventories out there circulating, and that has impacted uh, the way that um, the way that the production of semiconductor is going to go into in the, in the future yeah, formulation. So, uh, big multinational companies in Malaysia are basically looking into um, into cutting cutting down their production uh, in that nature uh, due to the oversupply. Right. So, uh, if you if you look at Malaysia, then um, uh, then uh, we see a strong uh, rebound in 2022. Uh, but um, but in 2023, we are predicting a growth of average of for, say four percent. Uh, so, MIF have predicted about four point five, IMF about four point four, World Bank about four, and ADB about four point three. So, if you just take average, then it should be somewhere here. Yeah. That, so, but that also depend, depends on the responses that we are taking up the measures and that we are taking up in terms of you know, cushioning the uh, implications of uh, the discoloration in economic growth and seeing ways of how do you create new growth areas so that you can accelerate uh, some of these numbers further. Yeah? And if you step back again uh, for 2022, uh, then what we see is that the, the rebound uh, where we have achieved about 8.7% of growth in 2022 is largely because of the services sectors. Right. So the re reopening of the economy has contributed in terms of accelerating services sectors, mainly in retail, in transportation, and food and beverage. Yeah. So these sectors were hardly hit uh, during the COVID-19 and, and in the consequent years and so forth. Yeah. So that rebound has helped us in terms of moving forward and ha having achieved higher target than what is being predicted before that, yeah, about 8.7%. But um but again, when we look at structural uh, differences uh, within within sectors, then we find that certain sectors are not moving that much uh, because of the structural issues that we have uh, within the context of the economy itself. A snapshot about uh, the community and uh, commodity and the energy price, I think uh, it is uh, kind of declining uh, um, after you know, having ever peaked in mid twenty twenty. So, uh, so in that in that context, I think um, we would be able to cushion some of this uh, implications of input high input costs uh, for for production. Uh, so, due to the uh, stabilization in in the, in the context of prices, yeah. So that is very crucial, uh, so that we can we can minimize the impact of input costs uh, on on the economy activities. Um, so obviously. Um, um, the energy price consumption, I mean, the energy consumption is predicted to increase by about 1.3% in 2023. Uh, and the World Bank is predicting that the energy price will go down about 10%, 10 to 11% uh, decline in the energy price in 2023. So that if, if that prediction uh, happens, then I think 
uh, we can cushion up some of this increase in the price uh, due to the price increase in say oil and energy yeah so this uh, relates to the one that I've talked about earlier. So the inflationary pressure is likely to be um, lower uh, in 2023 uh, as the input cost uh, pressure registered a sharp decline um, following the um, earlier slides that I, did, uh, I showed. Yeah? So it's likely to reflect correction in uh, crude oil palm uh, price and, and so forth. So that could have been able to cushion us um, during the time of um, uncertainty. Right. Um, as what uh, Imran has uh, um, mean, um, presented just now, uh, we believe that headline inflation will remain high for the year 2023. Uh, it's uh, uh, around 3.3%, 3, 3 3.4%. 3 4, 4%. Um, so that, that could be something that we need to look into uh, in terms of how do we maintain a more targeted number. Uh, a low, a lower number so that it, it's more manageable for us to move forward. Yeah. So because the implication of that it will be um, a higher um, you know, uh, price in terms of, um, I mean that that would impact uh, consumption and other other uh, economic activities, which is very crucial for the for the GDP, right? For the GDP growth and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so that that is basically the the macro uh, perspective. Uh, that I'm just giving a snapshot of those. Uh, I think Imran have given a more um, more uh, detailed uh, assessment of the macro uh, assessment of the economic activities globally and also for Malaysia. Uh, but currently, what is the major concern for the government is the cost of living crisis that is uh, affecting the near term. And if you look at the current challenges that we will be facing in the near term and also in the long term. In the long term, I think most of the challenges relate to climate change, right? So this has been a major concern uh, among uh, policymakers and also among investors as well. Yeah? So the failures to mitigate uh, climate change um, uh, issues, the failure to be, I mean, to have uh, I mean, climate change adaptation strategies, uh, natural disasters, biodiversity has become a key concern in the next few few years. Yeah. So, uh, meaning to say, if this concern becomes a major concern for many of the countries, uh, then uh, we need to reposition our industries uh, to move forward uh, in, in terms of how do we manage some of this uh, adequately. Yeah. Even um, if you look at the channels of how um, an economy being affected, it's not only financial system itself that is affecting the, the growth potential of a country, but also in terms of investment and trade, right? So if we don't uh, I mean address some of these long-term challenges that we face right now uh, that relates to climate change, or even that relates to technological adoption, then I think the potential for us to grow will be very limited uh, because the way that investment will flow in uh, will be different than before. And then the way that you do trade with other countries will also be different than before, right? Because the concern of say environmental, social and governance kind of uh, standards will be um, much demanding in the future, right? So uh, even um, investment agencies right now in Malaysia are facing a lot of difficulties in terms of um, bringing investment and also matching that investment with the domestic investment. Yeah. So like multinational companies, when they come here, they want to make sure that the supply chain is greener in that sense. And that requires us to upgrade ourselves in terms of how do we move into a greener production, say so. Yeah. So that we can plug in ourselves into the global value chain easily yeah so if that requirements are not met then there will be some difficulties for investment agencies to bring in say foreign direct investment into the country yeah because uh, foreign direct investment will be reluctant to invest if you don't have the indigenous industries like Malaysian companies who can support the production cycle or the, even the supply chain uh, in the longer perspective yeah. Uh, so what we are seeing right now, uh, some some recent data uh, in terms of production and trade data. Uh, we see some early signs of uh, declaration, I mean, in terms of uh, production. So um, if you look at the industry production index, then it is obviously uh, growing much slower. Uh, and if you look at the trade data, it is also showing a kind of declining trend uh, in terms of growth. 
right? So the exportation has uh, declined and import is declining. Yeah, so that is the recent data that I have. Yeah, so how would this being projected? So it be, because this kind of um, global economy slowdown, so the trade data are following those trends. And also the production data is also pulling those those kind of trends. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the production data, then we also need to see into uh, different segments of the industry. Um, so semiconductor being the largest industry, and if you track those semiconductors' performance, uh, then we can also look into uh, how those are being affected globally, and how would that be affecting the exportation. Right, so it's export uh, oriented industry industries and also versus non export oriented industry and how do they differ in that terms uh, so that um, because the exposure for these two categories of firms are quite different in that nature. Right, so when you understand those um, structure uh, and how it, it is moving forward in terms of production and trade, then we can have a better um, understanding of the of the economic growth in Malaysia itself. I also looked into uh, value addition data, uh, looking into different sectors like agriculture, mining, quarrying, manufacturing, and construction, as well as services. Um, this is very important because um, it's, it's, a, it's a question of how much value are you adding towards uh, the, uh, the, the, the production that you have within the context of the country. Yeah? So I think um, for a very long time, we are not adding adequate value um, towards uh, towards uh, production. Uh, meaning, say, uh, if you look at the export and importation data, then you can see they are moving co-currently. Yeah, so it's very tightly moving towards um, towards uh, the same I mean same growth rate. Um, that is due to that we are still very reliant on um, importation of technology, importation of capital goods. Uh, and that would would, would not accelerate uh, the the growth potentials. Yeah. So and and the value addition for some of these industries are quite low, right? Except for some of the foreign-owned multinational companies where they are having larger value additions, right? Uh, SMEs especially um, the value addition of SMEs towards production um, or, to, or or the contribution of the industry towards the economy development are quite quite low, right? So so that is a concern. Yeah? So if you look at the budget itself, then the government is trying to mitigate some of these issues by providing certain uh, incentives and policy prescriptions uh, for us to uplift the value addition activities of the of the industry itself. Yeah? And value addition is very much tied with uh, with uh, with uh, innovation with technological adoptions and so forth. And now we have a new game, right? So the Industry 4.0, for instance, is a different kind of technology. And those technologies should be adopted um, in uh, much uh, efficiently so that you can move forward in terms of creating more value for the for the firms and also companies. Yeah? But uh, on the on the other side, if you look at the trend of the growth of value addition, um, in 2020, of course, um, there was a negative uh, trend among the sectors, but what we are seeing now is basically uh, there's a kind of rebound in terms of value addition growth uh, for the major sectors, here, right? And uh, services has rebound to about 10.9%. Uh, so that is basically contributed by sectors that I mentioned earlier, retail and others. And uh, obviously manufacturing has rebound about 8.1% in 2022. Uh, so that rebound is also uh, critical for us to move forward uh, in terms of contribution for GDP, uh, followed by construction, about 5%, and also mining and coring, about 3.4%, right? But we'll, we'll be able to sustain this and then grow further. So that's a question about how we are positioning the companies, or also the, how do, do we strategize the company's movement in terms of addressing the near challenges and also the long-term challenges that I discussed earlier. Yeah. So if we were able to do that, then we can add more value to the group. Yeah. But obviously it requires a lot of self-discovery strategies by the companies which are involved in the production. Right? So self-discovery here means how do you discover new market? How do you discover new production 
uh, even no product on your services and so forth. Yeah? So that is very critical. And right now, through our research, what we find is that the self-discovery portion is very limited. Yeah, very limited because the reason being the knowledge acquisition of these companies and so on are very poor, right? Uh, even medium-sized firms are finding it difficult, uh, you know, in terms of moving forward, yeah. And issues of productivity and other things are still a big challenge for firms to move forward uh, in terms of value addition. Yeah. So there are a range of issues within the context of improving value addition. Uh, I think if we put the policy response right, then we can accelerate this value addition within the context of the company. So I'm looking at a micro site. I mean, how do the companies strategize themselves in terms of improving value addition? And I think that we are not ready for that uh, in many perspectives. Okay, this is an important graph that uh, we need to understand. See, the, uh, the, the fixed capital formation for Malaysia has been quite poor after the financial crisis, that is 1997-98, yeah. So you can see that we, have, we, we, are, we were doing well in the 70s when we had the industrialization strategies. So we brought in a lot of investment in the country and we have a golden year in 1980s and 1990s, right. So the capital formation is very important because that drives investment in industrial sectors, right. But what you see along the year after 1997-98 crisis, we never went back towards the period that we had good growth for capital formation, right? So uh, it been declining all the way. And uh, that is a sign of premature deindustrialization process, okay? Um, so sometimes we will be um, saying that we are moving forward in terms of growth, development stages. Therefore, we are moving into services. Uh, likewise, it's natural for us to have a deindustrialization process along the way. Yeah? But my concern is if you don't have the base, uh, the manufacturing base, then it's very important. Uh, it's very difficult for you to move forward as well because most of the creative activities also happens in the manufacturing um, sectors. Yeah? Uh, services also depends on manufacturing activities. right? So if you don't bind these two together, then it's very difficult for you to move forward. Unless you become a more, more creative economy, a more innovative economy, then drive in innovation in that sense in services, right? Uh, even if you look at the services sector itself, um, we are not into the, into the knowledge intensive services sectors. So that will limit your growth potentials in the future, right? So this kind of structural uh, elements that we need to look into. So how do we transit to a more productive and more value addition uh, activities within the context of the manufacturing sector itself. Yeah. Um, most often, we are still we are still in the, in assembly and and production stage. We have not went went into becoming you know, indigenous uh, producers uh, in in the context of becoming original equipment manufacturers or even becoming a, a design manufacturers and so forth. Yeah. So those kind of activities are very limited. So therefore. Uh, the value addition is also quite limited in, in overall, yeah. And then uh, the issue of productivity is still, I um, mean, still an issue for, for Malaysia. Um, when we plotted the productivity for different sectors, we find that you know, overall for Malaysia productivity increases for manufacturing sectors. But when we segment the sectors by size, by ownership, or by even other nature of the character of the sectors, then we find that there's huge differences in terms of productivity. And the other thing that is very observable in this uh, graph is that the manufacturing value added activities as percentage of GDP is declining, right? So it means manufacturing is contributing less and less. Yeah. So if you look at the proportion of contribution of services, manufacturing and so forth, services are contributing about 53%. But the main concern for services is that are we moving into more value added activities, right? Are we stuck with just low value added activities within the services sectors? Yeah. Or are we going, going into innovative services? Are we going into like knowledge intensive services? Okay. So if you look at the trade data on that perspective, then we find that we are still in deficit, right? Meaning, say we subscribe more knowledge intensive services than we produce ourselves. 
right? So there, there are some of the structural differences that we have within the context of the economy. And for you to catch up with other economies, um, those who have able to you know, uh, move up the ladder in terms of growth, uh, their structure is quite, quite different than compared to us. So this is a trend of, of manufacturing value added growth. So you can obviously see how we have we are going down in terms of value added activities uh, within the context of the manufacturing sector. So that is a main concern uh, because that uh, also drives employment and other other um, industries moving forward. Yeah. And the decline for value addition in in the context of manufacturing sector is basically because of the following issues. One is I think we are losing competitiveness especially with China, and then our capabilities in terms of self-discovery, in terms of identifying new strategies to move forward is also limited. Uh, we, have, we are lacking in terms of innovation. We are lacking in terms of new product, um, also in terms of new technology upgrading. Uh, even if you look at the production line, um, most of the production line are not being upgraded into uh, the manufacturing new, new product lines. Yeah. Um, the the other thing is which is worrying us is that there's a very low knowledge content and lack of learning uh, within the context of the industry itself. Yeah, and this new wave of trends that is happening now requires a close, I mean, close uh, monitoring of how we can accelerate the knowledge content of the industries and also uh, accelerate the learning process within the industry. Yeah? So now what we are seeing within the UNOS is that now more industry is coming to us to get a lot of important knowledge uh, with regards to say sustainability and so forth they, so that they can position themselves to move forward. Yeah? So the, the trend now is that it is not, it is more multidisciplinary in nature and you can't, you can't do things in isolation. So you have to collaborate with someone and then move forward in terms of creating more value for the production that you have within the context of the sectors. Yeah. So a bit of snapshot of the knowledge intensive service. So we also analyze the content of the services sector. Um, what we've realized is that the financial and business services are among the top um, knowledge intensive services uh, in Malaysia. They have registered high value added activities, okay, but not as high as what other countries are doing. And the progress is quite limited in that sense yeah although they are high uh, irrespective you know if you compare with other sectors within the services but uh, the growth of these service sectors are not as impressive as what others are recording yeah other services include health and social services as well as education services yeah so when when we do the international comparison between these services sectors which are more knowledge intensive services we find that Malaysia is still lagging behind yeah. So Malaysia's uh, contribution to the world uh, knowledge intensive services is about 0.79%. As a share of GDP is just about 4%, which is very, very low. Yeah. So we have to accelerate this so that we can mitigate some of the challenges that we are going to face in the near future. Right. Uh, in fact, the trade in these sectors are still in deficit, meaning say we are subscribing more services from outside than we producing ourselves. So what are the structural challenges that we are facing now? So how do we improve the potential of your GDP growth? Um, so one way to look into it is how do we address some of these structural challenges, which has been there for years. Yeah? So it means the old issues that we are still grappling with. So we have to move forward in terms of uh, addressing those issues. Yeah? So one is the productivity gain. So when we, um, when, we, uh, when we analyze the labor productivity across different sectors, different segments of the industry, and also the capital productivity of different segments of the, of the sec I mean, industry, we find that um, the, the rate of change in the productivity gains are not that impressive, you know, except for certain, certain sectors. You know. So in that sense, uh, we are going to lose competitiveness, right? So one is how do we manage these productivity gains? How do we design a policy or intervention um, so that we can accelerate the productivity growth uh, within the context of the industry itself? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of ways of doing it. Um, uh, I think um, that 
uh, depends on um, the sector itself, the character of the sector, and also many other things. Yeah. The other thing is that uh, from I mean, even earlier in the 1990s, we still we are still grappling with um, how do we foster technological adoption. Yeah. So now uh, it's more of the adoption of the new technology, which relates to Industry 4.0 technologies. For instance, AI, big data, and so forth. Right. So these are alien to us in many ways. But we also have to understand that technological adoption is not only about technology. Technology adoption is also about human-centric nature of the adoption itself. So I meaning, say, we have to craft a better policy in terms of incentivizing companies to adopt technology in that way. Right. So that has been addressed in some of the budget announcement recently. But but I think there are more things to be done uh, so that that uh, announcement will be more effective. Um, so usually we don't really see the value of the budget itself and how that will drive economic activities. We are looking into what kind of programs are you coming up with uh, in, in terms of uh, implementing those uh, amount that has been announced and how effective the program is towards driving this technological adoption. Yeah. So the, the, the devil is in the programs that we design. Right, so if we design a better program, then we can utilize those uh, uh, money more effectively and drive industrial industrialization process much better. Right, so that will contribute towards the GDP growth, uh, the, the larger context. Yeah, and also uh, the other structural challenges that we have is in terms of innovation R and D activities. Right, uh, so that is not happening rampantly. Uh, even within the context of um, companies which falls under R&D intensive companies. Yeah. So the percentage that is being invested for R&D activities are still low comparatively if you, if you compare that at the benchmark of other industries uh, within the context of the global um, uh, perspective. Yeah. Um, uh, when we say innovation, it's, it doesn't mean that you have to come up with radical innovation, even process innovation are very critical. So if you can improve your processes, say, so a simple process, sometimes it may not involve any money. So you don't really require a lot of investment in some of these aspects. So if you improve that, then we see a tremendous change in terms of production activities, tremendous change in terms of productivity gains and so forth. Yeah. I can give you a lot of examples on this uh, because we do a lot of firm level assessment uh, on how this simple innovation can, can lead to multiple benefit for the companies, yeah, including reduction of costs, um, increase in sales and so forth. Yeah. Uh, even like adopting best practices, right, are very critical for companies to move forward, for them to strategize. Yeah. Best, best practices alone uh, can contribute up to 20 to 30 percent in your performance change. Uh, so that that kind of micro assessment is not is not really um, being captured. Yeah? So we can talk about macro perspective of how the country is moving forward, but if you go into micro level of it, so it's very important for us to understand how of how some of these things are happening within the context of the industry and how do we move forward in incentivizing, incentivizing them to, to engage in some of these activities. Yeah? Obviously, the other one is the value addition. So we are trapped in the low value addition activities. And the labor market as what is being mentioned earlier so how do we there's a transition now in terms of labor market the kind of skills and competency required now is different than compared to previously so that is uh, an issue that we need to also manage yeah uh, if not uh, you will be having higher unemployment rate and then other 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 issues and challenges along the way yeah um, and most importantly we also have to find new sources of growth uh, we can't we can't rely on just the old uh, production um, activities. Um, so, and and in this in this manner, we have a lot of other opportunities that we need to identify as a source of growth for Malaysia. Okay, and the other structural uh, challenges that we have is uh, the lack of experiential learning and also creating dynamic capabilities among firms to move forward. Yeah, so that is very apparent in many of the industries as well. Right. Okay, uh, let me move on. So, what are the new industry trends that we have currently? Uh, so, 
they may pose opportunities and challenges along the way. I think one of the new trend is that um, the concept of Industry 4.0, the new technologies, which is having a lot of implication of how you manage your, say, uh, organization to move forward. So that will have an implication for structural change in many ways, right? Um, and this new technology has other implications as well in terms of issues of future of work. Uh, how do you manage your workforce currently? How can we move forward in terms of uh, reorganizing even our workforce? Uh, or even in, at the company level, how do you reorganize your tasks, right? Uh, which is given to your, to your employees, right? And technological progress in that sense. So here, I think there's a lot of initiative by the government through various uh, ministries and agencies to to accelerate the adoption of this new technology. Yeah. So, but my my, my feeling is that my, it's not just simple adoption of technology, but also how useful that technology will be for the companies to move forward. Yeah. So there must be some relevancy in terms of adoption and the usefulness of the technology. Right, it's not a simple adoption, but how do you make use of the technology to move forward? So that's where I'm finding a lot of lacking in terms of how companies are managing those technologies. Yeah, uh, simple adoption is there in most of the cases, but they cannot utilize that technology to the highest potential uh, or in you know, optimum level to move forward. So that is a very critical um, uh, issue that we need to address. Uh, reason being that we do, do not have you know, um, adequate um, knowledge or even skills in, in terms of operating those technologies to the fruitful um, uh, or optimum uh, level. Yeah? And also um, the policy choices that we are making, the government is making. Yeah? So um, most of the time policy is very important. And if you want to craft a better policy, you need to understand what is happening on the ground, on the field and digest those challenges that the industry is facing and, and then craft those policies accordingly. Yeah. So it's, it's based on the programs that you're designing. So if you are designing a good program, then it may have better impact on the economic activities. Yeah. So that is one. Technology is one challenge. The second challenge is the concept of sustainability. Right, so which have started off with SDG goals and now they are moving very strongly in terms of ESG. Right, uh, so environment, social, and governance uh, standards are coming strong. So the EU has drafted their own taxonomy on that context. Malaysia is also moving into that. Malaysia has come up with a sustainable financing taxonomy, uh, and this financing taxonomy will be affecting the way that companies can get financing in the future. Uh, not only that, uh, if you are involved in exportation market, then you are also being subjected to some of these standards. Right, environment, social, and governance. So we are very at the infancy stage in terms of preparing the companies to move forward in terms of reporting some of this uh, required standard. Yeah. So sustainability uh, reporting has been uh, an issue for many companies. Uh, in fact, we need to find ways of how to reduce the fee or even the charges that some of these services are being service providers are being, I mean, uh, providing to those companies. Yeah. So we also need to have um, our own local uh, service providers who can provide those kind of services, ESG related services to the companies and so forth, uh, so that we can move much faster. Uh, so these are some of the current issues that is, uh, is, is of concern if you are thinking about long-term um, economic growth for, for the nation. Yeah. So a bit on how some of this revised budget addresses some of these challenges that I mentioned earlier. Uh, of course, uh, I'm being very selective here. I'm just picking up here and there uh, to, to, to relate uh, some of these uh, challenges relating to technology and also sustainability. I think in terms of digitalization and automation, uh, the government is very clear about you know, supporting the industrial uh, progress in adapting those technology. But I think, um, again, it depends on how this money will be spent and what kind of programs are we going to establish within the context of the allocation that has been given. Yeah? So it's about how do we design a policy that could address multiple challenges by just addressing, say, digitalization. And I'll give you an example. If you're addressing digitalization, then you can also address the concern of ESG. 
right? So that if you if you bind this policy together and then use the money effectively in that perspective, then you can achieve dual goal rather than just achieving digitalization and automation goals. See, so that requires kind of collaboration within agencies and um, in ministries to see how effectively the program can be designed. Right, uh, so that um, the the schemes and other things will, will create multiple benefit for the companies to move forward. Yeah, uh, so we can we can like combine digitalization efforts and also green initiatives together. Right, so because digitalization has the potential for you to go greener. Right, to reduce say, to reduce your uh, greenhouse emission and and so forth. Yeah, so if you are able to do that, mix that together. Uh, then, um, then you have a better better perspective in terms of how do we prepare the industry sectors to move forward uh, in this uh, new new era, uh, where digitalization, you know, green initiative are becoming more stronger. Yeah. Of course, some of this um, 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 spending is more on infrastructure development, so that will boost up the the um, potential of your GDP because there's investment activities which is going on uh, within the context of the country itself. Yeah. Um, so these are some grants and incentive to drive domestic investment. So we have seen that we are having tough time in terms of driving domestic investment, and that requires kind of certain um, intervention in the market so that we can move forward in terms of creating new industries and then so forth. Yeah. Um, so this is a bit on the role of institution policy. Uh, so as I told you earlier, I think it's very important for us to digest the issue much clearer. If you want to position the the economy uh, outlook you know in a brighter way uh, rather than what you have now uh, in the near future right so some of this requires for us to understand the market failure that we have and what kind of intervention we require you know? see uh, you have to understand this the role of policy is basically to shape the key active active actors behavior in addressing some of this market failure yeah you know? so if you're successful in terms of shaping the key uh, economy actors behavior then then the, the market will respond towards your policy. So how responsive your policy depends on how do you program, uh, design the programs uh, for you to move forward. Yeah? So um, we have done a lot of program assessments. Yeah? So some programs work, some don't work. Uh, there are some challenges in making those programs to work and so on. Yeah? For instance, like tax incentive for innovation or tax incentive for R&D. Uh, so the issue is why the, the take up rate for this kind of incentive are low, right? So there's multiple challenges along the way. And we have to kind of reduce those kind of binding constraints that we have so that we can move forward. You know? So when we talk about policy, then we have range of different options, no? range of different options in terms of policy. And in that context, we need to see which policy or which design of policy gives you the optimum solutions. Right, optimum kind of benefits uh, for for the government, for the economy, and so forth. Yeah, so it's it, we require kind of new policy thinking in this manner, and institutional capacity to run um, or to even implement and monitor this kind of uh, policy progress are very very critical. Right. So here I'm just putting up some examples of policy choices. So say so, you have you having challenges with productivity so then you have to segment those uh, companies and then see where the challenges are why there's a challenges and so on so uh, there's a lot of data actually that we can work with uh, to see how uh, what what is the critical binding constraints that you have in terms of moving up the productivity ladder right um, so once we know that then we can do a more targeted policy so because we know who they are we can target those companies and then we can incentivize those companies to move forward in terms of productivity. Yeah. So it might not be like one fit policy for all. Uh, it should be more mission driven. It should be more targeted uh, so that uh, we can make that work so that we have more equal contribution of industries, right, towards uh, productivity gain and also in terms of uh, moving forward um, uh, in contributing to the overall GDP accumulation. Yeah. Uh, even here, policy choices of industry 4.0. Um, so we need to ask questions about how do we position ourselves in terms of this new wave of technology? Um, are we trying to understand the right issues and right challenges 
uh, what are the demand side challenges, what are the supply ch side challenges that we have to work on, and also how do we shift um, between these two, three dimensions, people, process, and technology. That are very critical. You know? So overall, uh, when we look into some of these issues, uh, uh, what we find is that the more successful policy are more mission driven, right? Uh, a country that have you know embarked on more mission driven uh, policy initiatives, which are very targeted, uh, are producing much better results than than those who are not, right? So and when we look into from the policy perspective, uh, it's not only about one area that you need to implement. Yeah? So you have to see what are the other dimension within the within the context of the ecosystem, which will um, benefit the companies to move forward. Yeah? So um, the key dimensions in this perspective is the regulatory dimension and institution dimension. We have a lot of work to do in terms of regulatory when it comes to digital technology. Right. So how do you uh, address the issue of data sharing? How do you address the issue of, say, um, a regulatory requirement for certain um, compliance, for instance, and so on? Yeah. How do you um, mean, um, uh, regulate a certain market, the geek economy, for instance, and so forth? Yeah. So those kind of things are very critical. If you don't have the regulatory uh, foundation, then the industry may not be able to operate uh, efficiently. Right. So that is a bit lagging in Malaysia. Uh, so we have to do a lot of work on that uh, to move forward. Yeah? The other part of it is how do you position the human capital to address some of this uh, new technology or even to address some of this uh, new development in terms of um, sustainability, for instance. Yeah? So there's a lot of requirements to change and review the education policy, the promotion of education, so how do you position that? And also the industry business relationship in that manner. Right? Uh, so if you can see this, that there, then you you realize that there's no one component that you have to address. You have to address few other components, other dimensions, which are very critical for the overall economic perspective. Yeah. So for us to move forward. Yeah. So the other dimension that we need to look into is the SGI policy, SME development, digital transformation, and also trade and investment promotions. Okay, so if you align this together, then we see a better prospect for the industrial sectors to move forward, right? I'm just talking about here, the last slide, uh, in terms of how do you apply a systematic thinking in terms of projecting you know, the, the growth of the nation uh, in terms of contribution of industrial sectors, yeah? Say so you are designing a program for enabling technology uh, in the industrial sectors. If you can map that technology to say positioning the other goals of yours, that is circular economy or even sustainability, if you know how it works, and if you come come together and then see how some of these technologies will be very crucial in terms of say contributing to circularity, then you can start targeting some of these technologies which are very critical, and you can have dual goals at the same goal in that in that manner. Yeah. So that's what I'm, I'm, I was saying earlier. When we design the programs uh, to to incentivize sectors to move forward in a much better way, uh, we have to see how we can collude different objectives of different ministries and agencies, and then shape them together and then move forward. Yeah. So that will enable the companies or the 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 economy actors to better position themselves and move forward. Uh, not only in terms of you know, adopting technology, but also in terms of addressing other issues, other pressing issues that we have within the context of the economy itself. So I'm just giving a brief kind of assessment um, on how we should move. So my main concern would be more on the trans transition that you're making in terms of structural transition that we're making. Yeah. So if you're not making those transition adequately, then your growth prospect uh, in the future would be very low. Right, so the potential of our growth will be very limited in that sense. Yeah, so I'll stop here for now. Um, so I'll, I'll be able to take questions if there's any. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nani. Thank you, Dr. Chandran. Uh, we have uh, a lineup of question, but uh, can I kick off uh, uh, by uh, for the question and answer session? Uh, 
Uh, you yes, mentioned yes. here, uh, Malaysia, some sectors facing some structural issues, which uh, the recovery could take longer than expected because of this. Can you share based on your findings, uh, which sector is that that actually uh, could be facing with structural issues that will, may require the government's uh, immediate attention? I think, I mean, <laughs> structural issues, um... See, most of the sectors are facing this issue of uh, innovation. Say, so, if you're taking innovation and R&D activities within the context of the sectors, uh, I think most of the sectors are facing it, but the intensity of the of the issue are different. Yeah? Uh, like, if you look at uh, electrical and electronic industry, for instance, which are a, a high contributor to economic growth, um, because within the manufacturing sector, this uh, E&E uh, become a very crucial sector for us because of the exportation and so on. Uh, there are some structural changes, I mean, structural challenges that we have within the context of E&E, for instance. Yeah? Uh, while the multinational companies are able to undertake some of these R&D activities, but still they're pressed about uh, how do we go about doing this R&D. And the supply chain that, that functions within the context of the E&E sector uh, is also limited. So if your suppliers are not um, adequate enough in terms of doing R&D, then it affects the whole chain of you know, having R&D activities in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. right? So the transfer of new product lines into Malaysia uh, will be affected because the capacity of the local firms are not there in terms of supporting those R&D activities. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so when I mention about uh, human capital, I think uh, in the context of E&E sector, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, good production engineers, we have created good production engineers, but um, some of these concern by the employers is that we don't have, uh, we, have we have not produced adequate R&D engineers. So, so in, that, in that perspective, it's very difficult for them to drive R&D activities within the context of the, of the sector. Um, so we, we do have certain initiative to accelerate these uh, R&D activities within the context of E&E, yeah? but um, we, we are not um, at, at par at if you look at other countries as well. So when you compare with other countries, we are not at par in that in that context. Yeah. So there's a lot of things to be done, uh, even in the most productive sector, um, because there are some structural issues that we need to identify. Yeah. Um, and say if you talk about palm oil industry, then I think uh, MPOB have played a very critical role in terms of uh, supporting the palm oil industry to move forward in terms of R&D activities. Why we are sustaining the palm oil industry is because our value chain of the palm oil industry is much better than compared to Indonesia. Uh, it's not about only just exporting crude oils, but also how do we uh, look into uh, byproducts? You know? How do we come up with innovative byproducts along the way? Yeah? So we have value chain until like uh, producing pharmaceutical product out of the palm oil industry. right? So that is because of R&D activity. So we are adding values in that nature. Uh, so our value chain, I mean, our kind of um, the, the supply chain for palm oil industry is much better than compared to Indonesia. So in that perspective, we can increase the value addition in other um, sectors, um, not only just you know, exporting uh, crude palm oil, but uh, how do we bring this to other uh, relevant sectors? Then it will be much better. Uh, we can create more economic activities and find new growth areas in that perspective. Yeah. Of course, palm oil industry are being also subjected to environmental scrutiny, uh, and they are looking into how do we do that in a more sustainable manner, right? So, so that that is an issue as well. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, I, I think uh, to produce talent, it would have to start from our, our education system. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning, do you find our STEM uh, syllabus is robust enough for us to produce talent, especially in engineering, R&D, uh, mm -hmm. that would serve the country uh, later uh, once they finish their tertiary education? Do you think that the government need to do something on the STEM, uh, the focus on STEM? Uh, yes, I mean, I think in terms of education, there are two sides of the uh, story of the coin. Yeah, One is... Um, Sometimes there are, there are issues about how these talent are being adopted into the companies, right? See, if the companies are not moving forward in terms of technology, if they are still applying old uh, practices and so on, they cannot utilize the talent that we produce. That is one issue, right? Sometimes our talents are overqualified. So I'll give you an example. If I teach an engineer about how to use CAT and CAM, for instance, 
and then if he goes to the company and then works in the company and then if they don't practice those kind of technology there it's very difficult for him to contribute in that sense right because he have learned more advanced syllabus but he couldn't apply it in the industry itself because the industry have not moved up the technological ladder okay, that is one issue of course the other side of the issue is also about the supply side of it yeah so meaning say when we produce graduate it's a graduate industry relevant right so most of the time there's a concern about rescaling the employee i mean the, the graduates so that they can get a better job right so we are spending a lot of time in terms of car time and costs in terms of rescaling those uh, those graduates that we are producing yeah? so that requires some form of say um, um, review of the curriculum so that we can make adjustments to the labor force that we are producing uh, in this context is the graduates uh, so that alignment requires a close collaboration between universities and industry yeah so uh, with, with the nature of stem i think it's important for us to look into it uh, to align this in a much better way uh, but the new technology is something uh, is, is something different than compared to in the past yeah because the new technology requires not only one domain knowledge it requires multiple domain knowledge okay um so so that is a bit challenging uh, a bit challenging in the context of it's not like one faculty can produce one right talent but it's a, it's a collaboration between faculties even you know so uh, so uh, so that will be something that we need to look into as well uh, why i'm saying that is say so you're talking about big data yeah so if you employ a computer science scientist and then ask him to run big data analytics for your company he can do it but he knows the technique but he won't be able to interpret what is being mined right out of the data and so on and then give useful information to the company ceos and so on yeah so you need another domain expert say so so if he's mining data say so on sales or on on um, data which relates to marketing for instance yeah then you need another interpreter who can make sense of this data so this two combination of knowledge, the marketing knowledge and also the business knowledge and the computer science knowledge is very useful. So that's how uh, you have to look into it. You know? uh, so that's why I say that it's not a simple adoption of technology. So you can say that oh, I have a data scientist in my organization, I have this technology to mine data and so forth. But how useful is that for you? How do you translate this to a more business sense? So in that sense, you require multiple experts so that's where companies are struggling now uh, in terms of how do we come up with this, right? How do we join this, combine this together and then move forward? Yeah. So this new technology requires multi, multidisciplinary knowledge. Uh, so it's not residing in one area, but it is residing in many areas uh, which you can have to combine it further, right? I hope that answers. Them. Uh, Dr. Chandran, can you hear me? Can? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, okay. Uh, before I go to uh, two questions by Dr. Yasmin and another one by Tangaraj, uh, how does the manufacturing-driven country like Vietnam or Indonesia uh, mm. address this issue of uh, shortage in, in, in talent when it comes to R&D, how did they do it compared to us? Uh, I would think that we are slightly better uh, because of we are slightly more advanced than them. But how do, how are they uh, addressing the matter and how do they manage the situation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, basically uh, we are much better. I mean, in terms of comparatively, we, we compare, say, like Malaysia and Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, for instance. Uh, but uh, still, no, we have to look into what is the purpose of the investment in our country, right? So if you are attracting foreign direct investment to Malaysia, for instance, what is the real concern of that uh, investor, right? So um, the, re the reason being why they are here is not, not because of market most of the time. It's because of the cost, right? So they will be able to shift. Uh, from one country to another country when there's a cost advantage for them. Yeah. Like if you look into why companies are going into China, it's because of market. Okay, because the market market is huge in China and therefore they are willing to even do joint venture and then enter the market in China itself. Yeah. So when there's a differences in when there's a 
cough differential in terms of uh, your your operation, uh, then they might choose to do it in Vietnam and and uh, as opposed to to Malaysia, yeah, because they are still running the low cost assembly production line in Vietnam, so it it does not require a lot of innovation in that sense, and it does not require different types of human capital, right? So I think what Malaysia have taken a position is that they want to drive in more value added value addition investment uh, in the sense that they want to bring better um, technology and so forth. Yeah. So we are targeting on those, those segments. So Vietnam is still at the bottom line in terms of investment. Uh, so they are not targeting the high value added. Of course, they are doing it, but uh, gradually in that sense. So they're also trying to fix policies and, and instruments, other instruments to make sure that they move up the ladder again. Yeah. So of course, uh, so because they were below us, they are recording much better growth in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but we are a middle income country and we are trapped there for so long. And then for us to make the transition from middle income to upper, say, so or even developed country, then it requires much more effort than compared to if you compare to Vietnam. Right. So it requires us to move um, in many multiple directions in terms of human capital and other things. Yeah. So the, uh, the nature of investment is different. Uh, so uh, because we want to move up the value chain, uh, so our issues are actually different than Indonesia and Vietnam because they are actually, they don't use a lot of uh, input, uh, value input compared to, to us. We want to uh, what they call move the value chain. So we have to address uh, the talent issue for Malaysia, am I right? Yes, yes, that's true. That's yes. True. Okay, uh, Dr. Yasmin, you have three questions or four, but two is for Dr. Raja. But uh, I will uh, uh, direct uh, Dr. Yasmin a few questions. Uh, she has a few questions on geopolitical, but uh, two is for Dr. Raja. But then again, uh, she also have a few, uh, one uh, related to Dr. Chandran. Uh, Dr. Yasmin from PNB uh, is asking, what are the low hanging fruits for you? For uh, you see that you see uh, to can that can be the uh, new sources, a new source of growth for Malaysia. Which sector that you think um, that could actually power our growth other than manufacturing, or which sector that you think that could actually uh, Malaysia can capitalize uh, to drive our growth going forward? Um, I think there's a lot of potential in the services sector, um, especially given the new uh, new form of uh, trends, uh, which relates to uh, technological progress and also the issue of sustainability. Um, we have a bunch of new um, youth who are now trying to create this new technology. Yeah? Um, we have companies which are embarking in drone. And, and many other things, right? So I think um, the 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 way forward is to look into uh, creating more venture capitalists in this in this context, so that we can create new sources of growth. So the identification of sectors uh, depends on how are we planning the long term growth of the sector itself. So uh, I think for some of the sector, we already have some um, blueprints of how do we move forward. But uh, what we require is not one sector as the key driver, but also the, the combination of manufacturing and services. Okay, I'll give you an example. So let's say so I, I produce a smartwatch, right? So this smartwatch will not perform well if I, 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 can't, I can't break the market if I don't have the platform for it, right? So I require another person or another company who can provide the platform or you can do it yourself if you have the capability. So you can sell smartphones when you have combined that with services, uh, services, services platform so that you can use the smartphone much effectively, right? So I can go give a cloud, say cloud storage, and then I can link these two together, right? So that is what a lot of manufacturers are experiencing now, even in the E&E &E, uh, sectors, yeah? So you have the product, but you, have, you don't have the support, services support. To move forward, yeah, and then if you look at um, the manufacturing and services, um, what what happened is that along the way the manufacturing profit margin has declined so much so that many of them are going into services, yeah. 
so they are also capturing the services part of it and then they are integrating the services part within the manufacturing industry right so that you can capture value because the value is more captured more in the services rather than manufacturing itself yeah because the cost of I mean, the, the price of manufacturing products is declining so, so much so that you are trying to identify new segments of the market, right? See, like uh, very soon car manufacturers, um, you, you make more, uh, more money out of giving the services, after sales services for the car that you produce than selling the car itself, right? And the car is becoming more complicated now, right? So it's becoming more smarter. You have integrated new technology into the car and so forth, right? So normal uh, workshop may not be able to manage those new technology changes, right? So very soon these normal workshops will be dying off and then it will be replaced by the manufacturer themselves are taking these segments of the services and then they're integrating, right? So when they integrate, then they see better prospect. So um, if you segment the market in that way, looking into the whole supply chain, then you can understand where the pockets of opportunities are. Right, so so that's what the policy policymakers should do. So looking into the different segments of the value chain, and then how how much value is created in each of the chain, and how do we move forward? So how do we position ourselves within the context of value chain? Right, and how do we take this opportunity together? Yeah, even when investment agencies are looking into bringing investment, mapping those value chain is very critical because you know where the pockets of investment is not available currently in Malaysia, right? And which are available and then how do you can how do you match these together so that we can grow much better. Right. So that kind of uh, an assessment is needed um, for us to promote the whole ecosystem of the industry itself. So it varies. Uh, we have pockets of opportunity, but to find those opportunity, we shall really map up those those uh, value chain of the industry itself. So in short, because uh, technology is rapidly evolving, the you have to find pockets of opportunity uh, to find our uh, niche. Uh, to say manufacturing per se is can no longer be applicable because it's uh, not it's about sub segment, am I right? So we have to find our uh, pockets of opportunity that we can uh, capitalize on, am I right, Doctor Chandran? Yeah, I mean, the manufacturing base is still important for us, but how do we improve the value chain? So if you want to improve the value chain, what are the pockets of other opportunities which are available? Then you can link them within the context of manufacturing and then move the value chain up, right? Uh, what we find is that there's a disconnect between manufacturing and services. There's a huge disconnect between these two uh, mm -hmm. because they should be supporting each other and then move forward, right? So we don't, we don't really see that uh, in many perspectives. So when there's no support, your manufacturing activities will shrink uh, because you cannot move to the higher value added activities because there's no ecosystem for that. Mm -hmm. On that score, uh, Dr. Chandran, there's another question by Dr. Yasmin. Uh, what would be an exemplary mission-driven policy uh, that you, can, uh, you, you could share with us? What would be among the uh, policy that we can be proud of so far that we have called the shots right? I um, that is a difficult question to answer. I mean, in terms of what is right, I think some of this. I mean, we have done some of it in a right manner. Um, some creation, some institution. Uh, I don't know whether I should name them. Um, uh, creation of right institution, like let's say CRAS, for instance. Yeah. So they are they are driven by industry, uh, multinational companies, and they are trying to accelerate innovation. Uh, and R&D activities within the context of E&E industry. Uh, so they are, they are, uh, consortium is looking into how do we collaborate with multiple partners uh, in order to bring this, um, I mean, and improve the value addition of the industry itself. Okay, I think in in in, in a greater extent that has, uh, has been a good model for us to move forward. Uh, even MPOB, I think they have done a very good job in terms of accelerating the the R&D activities within the context of uh, of the industry, uh, palm oil industry. Of course, I mean, this is driven by industry themselves. So one way to do it, if you want to have a better model, is that um, it should be industry driven, number one. Number two is we have to find out thematic um, challenges that we have within the context of industry and then bring the stakeholders together and then move forward. Yeah, so it's more of a collaborative effort. 
So if you have those kind of framework, then we can anticipate better industrial development process. Yeah. So the success of say like Taiwan, Korea is that they have created the ecosystem to support the industrial development process. Yeah. Uh, so the barriers are being minimized. You know, they they try to reduce the binding constraints that the industries has and so forth. Yeah. And then also the regulatory reform. So that is very critical. Right. Um, so, so that um, industries are not bind by a lot of regulation, uh, outdated regulation, which you no know, don't allow them to move forward and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, I think some of this, uh, there are some pockets of uh, success, um, uh, which we can be proud of. But I think there's a lot of areas that we need to improve as well. Uh, we do have one more question from the floor. Uh, quickly, how do we focus? The Malaysian GDP is investment expenditure to ICOR ratio is a good indicator of GDP growth, Dr. Chandra? Okay, um, it will be a bit tricky when you want to forecast during the uncertainty time uh, because there's a lot of intervention in the market. See, if the market works by itself, then it's easier for us to forecast because uh, we don't need to impute the policy response within the context of the forecast itself, right? Uh, so if you leave it to market, then it's easier for us to find the right trajectory and then focus them. Yeah? So what we are finding now, we are doing some work for some of the banks. We are forecasting GDP for them. Uh, what we are finding now is that uh, the, the accuracy of the forecast um, is very much dependent on the policy response. Okay? So we try to impute those policy response within the forecast model. Um, but for that, for, for us to do that, we need to have adequate information about what would be the policy response to some of these shocks that the government is trying to uh, put in place. Yeah. So when we have lack of data in terms of some of these policy response, then obviously my forecast will not be that accurate. Okay, that's why we I have to revise the forecasting uh, many times. Yeah. So that's that's happened to World Bank and other other guys as well. So um, there's no one one indicator. Um, which can provide you what but what we build is more of a system uh, a system to to forecast yeah? so uh, there are two ways of forecasting one is you can take like you know, just identifying few indicators and then trying to use that to forecast the other one is to build the whole model the whole system the economy system so there will be a lot of interaction between the variables within the system itself and then it corrects by itself and then projects your your gdp yeah so of course, um, um, some variables are very weak variables for you to use as a forecast. Some are good variables. I mean, of course, I mean it depends on uh, your model. You know, so whether you are taking uh, what kind of approach are you taking for your for your modeling part of it. So I I, I can't really give precise information about uh, which variable will be much better. But uh, what we are doing here is basically more system approach. Uh, so we interrelate uh, interest rate to many other variables and and so forth, and then try to do the forecasting in that way. So yes, that I agree with Dr. Chandran that uh, forecasting GDP can be a nightmare to economies uh, because there are so yeah. many intangibles that you have to factor in that sometimes we don't have data to really impute. So that's why uh, some GDP numbers are, are sometimes off the tangent that we cannot uh, really factor in certain things. On that score, uh, I have two final questions uh, for, for Dr. Chandran. Uh, you mentioned that our aggregate investment is actually lagging. Uh, that is actually a concern. Now, mm -hmm. so this is where uh, the the this is where the the tricky issue is. How do we balance? If we are so fast, like forty percent of uh, aggregate investment, like in China, is overheating, but for mm -hmm. Malaysia, twenty percent of GDP is a bit slow. So where do we strike a balance that, okay, this is uh, adequate for Malaysia? Is it 25? Is it 30? Because as we move into a consumption-driven economy, so we have to balance uh, between aggregate investment and aggregate consumption. Now, what is the uh, the ratio that is actually safe for Malaysia as we move our country into a high-income country? So your view on that? Uh, in terms of ratio, I'm not I'm not very sure. I'm not, I have not looked into that. Um, but... But my take is that uh, the ratio is still low um, in terms of uh, investment. Um, but but the challenge that we have in, in the context of investment is that uh, the data that we have for investment is basically uh, approved investment. So 
if you want to forecast, then there's a proof investment. But we are not being able to identify what is the realized investment over the years, right? So that that is something that we need to look into. So if if there's adequate data on in terms of realized investment, uh, in terms of um, say the industrial sectors, then it will be much better for us to uh, compute uh, the the prospect uh, of the GDP. So so in that context, I think um, in terms of ratio between consumption and investment. Um, it, it depends on how you want to drive the economic activities in, in that regards. Yeah. But I think uh, still the investment ratio is quite low um, in, in Malaysia and that should be accelerated further. Mm -hmm. um, on that score, you I pick up just now you mentioned about greener production process. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the demand of investors now before they, they put your money into FDI, into our uh, sectors. So can you elaborate further? What do you mean by greener production process? Would it be from end to end or they are now expect you to be the holistic, uh, the whole process has to be greener? And then can you give example on that? Okay. Um, so I think the what where the world is moving forward is... Um, in terms of uh, issue of climate change is uh, the reduction of say emission yeah so that can be co2 or any any other gases yeah so when they do this they don't only capture your direct uh, emission of a com company they also capture the indirect emission of the company so if you want to be a supplier say so to one company right multinational companies then you have to also comply to the amount of emission that you are creating out of your production yeah so it means it's not only the direct emission that you're producing, but also the indirect emission that you're producing. So in that nature, so when you want to join a link in the global value chain uh, uh, by being a supplier to say another multinational company, then that kind of requirement is coming in. So they are trying to say, um, uh, quantify those emissions, right? So, so in that nature, you have to also start uh, I mean, start uh, calculating what your emission is so that you can be able to report to them what are the sources of emission, how how you are trying to mitigate those, those emissions. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. The the electricity usage. So if the electricity usage is too high, and if you're not doing anything to mitigate that electricity usage, which contributes so to, say, CO2, uh, then you're not in the position to take a strategy to reduce your, say, um, uh, carbon carbon footprint in that context, yeah. So I think in, in the future, this will become, the requirement becomes stronger. And when the requirement becomes stronger, these multinational companies are going to use that reason and then source their inputs from elsewhere, right? So meaning to say there will be a big uh, shock for the local industries who are now unable to Know, plug into the global value chain in that sense, right? So that will limit the capacity of you know, these small businesses, I mean, uh, medium size and small businesses who are being the suppliers of the multinational companies. You know? So if that requirement comes very hard, then then I think we'll have a problem in terms of you know, losing a lot of businesses out of, out of context, right? So that's what I mean by you know, moving into more greener production and other things. Uh, Dr. Nani, are you, are you there? Is it, uh, is it uh, imperative for you to have uh, uh, greener processes in your system? Otherwise, you're going to lose your FDI to other countries? Uh, yeah, if that requirement comes very hard, then, I mean, uh, of course, the uh, investment will be limited as well. I see. Okay. Um, it's not only investment, but also exportation later. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the guy kind of like even social issues, you know, they're coming coming in very strong and people are banning your exploitation because you don't comply to certain social standards. Mm -hmm. 
uh, even as we speak, investors are actually demanding all the listed company to be what they call on on the on the right foot uh, for the ESG initiative. So that mm -hmm. is actually translated into the share price movement. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chandran, uh, for his insight on that. Uh, I find it very refreshing uh, to hear about uh, a few things that uh, actually could put us into the pedestal, which is the greener production process, and also uh, the country that have to keep on uh, what you call pressing on the the issues or address the issues on the talent shortage for Malaysia, which we have been hearing this for quite some time, or in other words that we have been facing with brain uh, drain uh, across the country, especially when we met uh, the manufacturing companies uh, in Penang, that they are actually grappled with the issue because of the uh, talent shortage on that matter. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandran, for your insight, and we hope uh, to be hearing for you again in the future as the, as the global economy is evolving. Now, uh, today we are facing with the uh, banking crisis in the US. By the time we'll be speaking to you, it could be other issues that we're facing. It could be geopolitical. It could, it could be something else. And uh, we thank you uh, for all your knowledge sharing that we have today. And uh, we hope on uh, the floor, uh, if you have any question, if uh, you want to ask for the uh, Dr. Chandran or Dr. Raja, just type uh, into the chat box and one mighty will, uh, will de uh, relay and forward the, uh, the question to uh, the panelists, which is Dr. Chandran and Dr. Raja. Otherwise, thank you, sir. Uh, have a great day and we will uh, sure we'll be, uh, we are very sure we will be in touch with you very soon or in the future uh, for the, another economic forum. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandran. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nen. Okay, all right. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Raja is waiting uh, in the lobby. Dr. Raja? Uh, before Dr. Raja uh, getting ready uh, to be... Yeah, uh, I think I'm in now, yes. Okay, Dr. Raja, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Datuk Professor Ulung Dr. Raja, as I mentioned, uh, is currently the advisor to the government. Uh, he has a very distinguished, uh, what do you call, CV to, to begin with. Um, just briefly, he's, he obtained his doctorate uh, uh, in economics from uh, Cambridge University in 1992, and he was a Rajawali Fellow of at uh, Harvard University in 2014. Um, he has a very long, uh, what do you call, credential in economy, uh, economy in economics related uh, functions. He has uh, delivered pu public lectures uh, and policy talks, uh, keynote speech, uh, speeches in several top universities, uh, very reputable, namely Cambridge, of Oxford, Harvard, Columbia, and we are very lucky. Uh, to be able to get him today, uh, despite his very busy uh, schedule, uh, now he's uh, being the advisor for the government uh, alongside Tan Sri Hassan American. Maybe he can share a few of his experience so far. Uh, now, Dr. Uh, Raja uh, will be uh, speaking. Uh, the topic is the global econo economy slowdown. Uh, is the global economy slowdown likely to culminate in stagflation? Uh, you know that uh, we all know that um, currently inflation is quite elevated and growth momentum is moderating. So Professor Raja will be able to give his insight and what would be his advice to the government uh, of the current situation. How, how should Malaysia respond? Now, Dr. Raja, before I pass the floor to you, uh, we do have two um, uh, geopolitical questions from the chat box. Uh, that uh, we will um, we will uh, read out to you uh, later once you finish with your presentation, uh, which is from Dr. Yasmin. And note that uh, for all the participants, if you have uh, questions that you want to ask, uh, do post on your chat box or you can participate in a question and answer later. Otherwise, Dr. Raja, the floor is yours. We are so looking forward for the session with you. Uh, please, uh, please, please, uh, uh, you, uh, please start with your presentation, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, you're Rosanani, right? Yes, Dr. Raja. Yeah, sorry. I um, <clears throat> actually gave a much briefer caption about me to Imran. I'm not sure this must be prepared by you all. Uh, it doesn't, of course, um, look at me uh, contemporaneously because most of what put there, or perhaps all of them, are quite dated. But that's okay with me. Uh, thank you. But let me um, mention that the 
the slides that I'll be sharing, I forgot to change the title, but the title that you mentioned just now is indeed the one I'll be speaking on. Uh, let me share the screen. I'll take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the organizers. I believe it's BBIM, IMB, and, and the rest of the banks, as well as Bursa. I've spoken at Bursa meetings before. I'm not sure if the members from there here at this moment. <clears throat> Let me just uh, get on to share content, but I don't seem to. Let me see. Um, I think you all have a, have a probably different way of getting there. Uh, I, I give my lectures, but I don't seem to see it this way. <clears throat> Share content, it's just hanging. Can someone assist me? Tato, uh, can we just upload uh, the slides that you give us? Yeah, yeah, sure. Although I made some changes, but that's okay. Please. Okay. Okay, we do it. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay, as, as you see uh, from the title that uh, Rosinani mentioned just now, this was the older title that I used, but it's largely the same because we're discussing the post COVID-19 pandemic rather than the pandemic itself. Um, and then of course I will draw uh, implications for Malaysia. <clears throat> um, let me see, can, can you move to the next slide please? Yeah, the shift to endemic from pandemic, but of course we are in a situation where the health threat remains. Um, economic contractions and slowdowns caused by lockdowns and disruptions. This this actually, we no longer face in any serious sense. Um, and as Rosnani mentioned just now, uh, people are increasingly, at least for the moment, worried about uh, uh, banking crashes. Uh, um, we've already had more than three banks now that have, that have gone bust, and we are expecting more. Um, now, we do need to understand that the, all these predictions that the World Bank and the IMF came up with uh, whether we'll have a V-shaped recovery or a W-shaped recovery has been clouded by the subsequent development in the Russia-Ukraine war, um, which obviously brings lots of implications, not so much the war itself, but the sanctions that come, uh, which has actually caused um, or hastened further disruptions in supply chain. <clears throat> and then we have uh, the American Fed with its policies um, to contain inflation. Um, and the, the only instrument that is widely used by the Fed almost all the time, which is also to me uh, a major cause of the implosion of the US economy in, in 2007, 2008, is largely because of this policy of raising interest rates too far beyond uh, what the threshold should be. We'll come back to that subsequently. <clears throat> and then, of course, I will deal with uh, the economic consequences for Malaysia. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, we, we see these things happening. Uh, resumption of flights, tourism, and the end of social distancing, which are, are welcome uh, developments, except that we are now um, um, not necessarily uh, facing an environment where we, we evolve uh, with, with no limits. The reemergence of investment and trade blocks and the return of protectionism is very much in the air, especially so with economic sanctions. It's interesting to note that uh, economic sanctions here also means that that um, the two key drivers of uh, global trade and investment, <clears throat> here I'm referring to the regulators of uh, the two uh, located in Washington, the World Bank and the IMF, are no longer um, active in terms of seeing that that indeed uh, continues because we now have, uh, have sanctions. The sanctions actually mean that major exporters of essentials, uh, in this case, Ukraine and, and Russia, uh, although the sanctions are not on Ukraine, uh, but because there's the war there, plus Russia itself, we have a serious shortfall in 
in essential items like rapeseed oil, sunflower seed oil, wheat, and things that you require to grow them, uh, fertilizers, and of course, oil and gas. Uh, so much so that uh, a country like Germany, 65% of its fuel coming from Russia, has actually been uh, seriously affected. But of course, there are different means. A lot of it is clouded now, not very much official. Jeffrey Sachs says that a lot of this oil are being smuggled from, say, Venezuela uh, into, into Western Europe. We'll have to check those facts, but I think there's, there's quite quite a bit of incriminating evidence to suggest that these things are happening, especially so with the bursting of the bombing of the Nord Stream pipeline, oil pipeline um, <clears throat> connecting Ger Germany to to Russia, and 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 then of course the um, the notion of um, of a bullish growth in 2022, we faced that though. We Malaysia enjoyed a, a GDP real GDP growth rate of 8.7 exceeding our, our expectations to achieve 8.4 percent but i don't think this is going to be repeated part of the reason why we achieved that is also because of a small starting base and then of course we've had a uh, resumption of many activities which i just mentioned above <clears throat> now let me get to the fuller screen now we faced actually rising unemployment in 2020 um, but falling unemployment in 2021 it's not very clear from 2023 whether that will be the situation, even though we, we are into an era where we are both digitalizing and um, di facing digitalization and at the same time digitizing um, a lot of instruments through IR 4.0 uh, technologies. <clears throat> but this is the title that I actually used um, eventually, but it should be up there. Are we facing the threat of stagflation? and exchange rate fluctuations. Uh, uh, perhaps maybe we should include the word volatile. Now the first term here, stagflation. Stagflation refers to both stagnation and inflation, hyperinflation. When you combine the two, you have stagflation. In other words, the Phillips curve breaks down at that point in time. There's no inverse relationship between inflation and, and, <clears throat> and money wages. Um, and, and this happens um, uh, when uh, the system goes into chaos. Now, are we going to face that? We'll come back to answer that gradually, um, uh, which means to say you will have high unemployment and high, high inflation. Uh, that we have high inflation is relatively clear, as, as is seen by attempts by the Fed to raise interest rates in the U.S. Um, in the face of um, uh, continued high inflation. <clears throat> Next, next slide, please. The, the economic impact of the Russia-Ukraine war. I, I will deal with this and then subsequently deal with um, um, the Fed's, Fed's policies. And, and then at the same time, try to co connect that with what the US did, um, especially when Alan Greenspan gave, gave way to Ben Bernanke in 2007 um, 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 to take charge of, of the Fed. <clears throat> Economic sanctions imposed by the U.S. and its NATO allies. Now, I think the sanctions more than the war itself uh, is a problem. Um, um, I will get to that. Within ASEAN, while condemning the Russia-Ukraine war, except for Singapore, uh, for some reason, Singapore is always aligned with, aligned with, um, with the U.S., not, not so much China as many people think. Um, no other ASEAN member has embarked on imposing economic sanctions on trade and investment involving Russia. Fortunately, unlike, say, um, the position Malaysia and the rest of the ASEAN countries took, and at that time, uh, uh, the greater Indochina as well as Myanmar were not part of ASEAN, we took a position because we were worried about the domino effect, and therefore we took the side of the U.S. Uh, with regards to the Vietnam War. But that's not the same now. Uh, we, are, we are fairly neutral in that sense. We still have the Russian ambassador here. <laughs> Initial impact of the war and sanctions drove the ruble down, with Biden claiming that the ruble will eventually be turned into rubble. It, that's what he said, um, although, of course, subsequently they tried to do some sort of um, attempt to, to correct the situation by claiming that he, it was not what he meant. But I think that he actually meant that as what Jeffrey Sachs says. We'll, we'll get to the figures afterwards. <laughs> However, the, uh, uh, the ruble has recovered. Um, the ruble has recovered and it's around the same value. In fact, it's gone higher at this moment. Russian exports dominated by essentials such as oil and gas. 
wheat, fertilizer, and cooking oil. And here, I'm, I somehow feel that part of the reason why we have a massive, um, uh, relatively big increase in demand for palm oil, especially so when the EU and the US have, have all sorts of restrictions, even though they have not embargoed completely as such, the, the EU. And their official embargo, I think, is planned for 2030. Although we, Malaysia as well as Indonesia, are protesting uh, that possibility. But I think that's largely because uh, the main exporters of rapeseed oil and sunflower seed oil are no longer in the picture. Russia's insistence on the use of ruble in trade um, uh, transactions means that the essentials that they're exporting have, have traction, have a, a currency in terms of countries interested in buying. We all know that the, um, the demand for essentials, uh, the, we refer to those goods as inferior goods because um, reasonable changes in price is not going to um, uh, block its consumption. It's just like uh, you, you can't be stopping from eating rice, for example. Um, and that's, that's what happens with essential goods or, or um, different goods. <clears throat> Alternative financial system evolved by the BRICS. We should also be aware that Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are working on an alternative financial system that can then bypass the IBAN and all other forms of currency um, 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 transfers. Um, uh, this is actually evolving quite strongly, and um, which might partly explain also why the, the currencies of these countries, including the renminbi from China, hasn't really seriously crashed. <clears throat> Given Russia's economic past and its friendship with the large economies of China and India, isolation seems to only recreate the iron curtain of the past. Now, I, having had traveled in Russia, I, I believe they are used to living in the way they do. Perhaps um, uh, we may not be able to survive there because of the circumstances of how the poor live in Russia. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is what I mentioned earlier. You can see the fall of the of the ruble against the dollar, um, dollar here. Uh, you will find that it's fallen when the wars took place. But then subsequently, there's a trend increase in the value of the ruble. I, I, I couldn't extend this that much further, but but it has stay, stabilized, but with a trend towards rising against the dollar. The next one, please. That's with the euro, I suppose. Yeah, and you see the same pattern here, um, which means to say that these countries have remained firm. Although, of course, I believe, um, it was, which is quite explicit, the U.S. is looking for regime change in Russia. Um, I'm, I'm, my own guess is it's not going to happen because even regime change initiatives in Iran, in, uh, in North Korea, in Cuba from the, from the 60s, and, and of course, uh, Venezuela hasn't happened. And Russia is a huge, hugely bigger country. <clears throat> Next one, please. Yeah, this is the economic impact of sanctions and the U.S. Fed policies. The world has seen higher inflation and unemployment rates in the past, indeed, uh, than in 2019 and 2022. We also saw uh, such a crash, which also led to the U.S. withdrawing the U.S. dollar from the fixed exchange rate mechanisms in 1971. Many think that it was used to ensure that the value of the dollar that the U.S. Uh, Fed would pay uh, crashed so that they would use all the surpluses to finance the Vietnam War. Well, that that's uh, some of the assessments by others. <clears throat> um, uh, inflation fell considerably in 2019, 2020. I'm sure you're aware there were many a time super tankers carrying oil, uh, carrying oil, um, were stranded in ports like Singapore, and they had to be bought. Um, uh, they had to be bought by the the. The, the supplies of oil and gas because the storage cost exceeded that of the price of oil. The price of oil had fallen that much lower. And of course, the, uh, Singapore also took advantage of it because Singapore has, a, has got a world-class petrochemical industry to have them in silos for their use subsequently. <clears throat> However, rising oil and gas prices led to rising inflation since 2021. Um, it's, it's, the, the situation we have, not just in Malaysia, the whole of Southeast Asia, it's quite peculiar in the sense that while CPI has gone up, indeed, there's been a trend rise, but the escalation of prices, um, uh, food prices have soared far, far higher, largely because the, the resumption of exports and imports, for example, involving logistics did not really translate into its use involving uh, food producers and knowing very well that most food producers are small scale farmers. 
relying on uh, 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 intensive farming as opposed to extensive farming. And that actually uh, uh, also means that lots of these small farmers eventually went out of business because they could not get the output to, to the markets. Food inflation grew more steeply. Uh, I just mentioned that um, because of disrupted supply chain far more because there was no attempt. Even though when I was with uh, Datuk Mustafa Muhammad's um, Prihatin and Panjana um, um, preparation um, committees in, in APU then, in fact, I, I was perhaps the earliest to call for the lifting of all constraints on logistics. I actually also meant the small scale guys involved that supply, produce and supply uh, vegetables, fruity vegetables, uh, horticultural products, as well as uh, fish. <clears throat> While unemployment stayed steady among the low and middle income countries, it fell strongly among the high income uh, countries from 2020. I'll show that in the figures subsequently. Economic sanctions and US Fed policies more than the uh, Ukraine war is threatening a rise in stagflation. Now, let me mention that um, in, when the US economy imploded, what the US witnessed in 2007, 2008, but we felt it in 2008, 2009, was a rise in interest rates to contain inflation. When Alan Greenspan left, the Fed rate was 0.25%. But when Ben Bernanke came, and, and because he considered himself, even though he shared the Nobel Prize last year, Nobel Prize for Economics, uh, Ben Bernanke, he felt that he had failed and he resigned, went back to Princeton. And at the time he left, interest rates had gone up to 5.25% in the US. It strangled housewives who borrowed at such low levels and they had to pay at that much higher levels. It also led to small businesses going out of business and many other businesses. Now, this is what we call eventually translates into non-payment, non-paying loans, meaning there's no one servicing those loans. And that much of deposit is gone, even though you might declare this firm is bankrupt, but it doesn't um, uh, lead to any return of those deposits to the banks, which of course trigger uh, banking crisis. Uh, the, the situation we face now is, is quite a bit different, more or less similar, but it has this additional thing because you have uh, treasury bonds. Many buy treasury bonds because typically a, a, a central bank prints money. Commercial banks get that sort of money. They keep 5% of it. That, that's the liquidity <coughs> ratio. They have to lend it out because otherwise they have to service the, the money that they borrow from, from the central bank. So it's it's unlikely uh, beyond that 5% these banks would keep, keep the money. Now, if you are going to have at least in this case, you might as well, all those surpluses, you might as well buy treasury bonds. And treasury bonds in the US typically either take 30 years to mature or 20 years or even 10 years. Now we have 10 years. But now we have a situation where the, the, the one that is over 10 years and the rates are fixed. Of course, you could be bought a year later or subsequent year. That's why each year the, the mean uh, interest rates change because it's how it's auctioned each of the years over those periods, 10 years, 20 years and 30 years. Now, it's, a, it's about 3.9%. Um, that's the rate you get from the treasury bond. But you have to pay an interest rate because of the Fed, and that you have additions to it at 4.75%. Then you can see even there you have arbitrage um, uh, deficits in, the, in how these things happen. So you, in this case, the banks are facing a double whammy, one of which is shrinking and crushing um, um, businesses that have borrowed money from them. And the second one is the, the arbitrage differentials that you see from what they get from the treasury bonds against uh, the Fed rates. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So it's not surprising, I must say, that you have this uh, Silicon Valley Bank crashing. Um, and, and this is likely uh, to be a contagion because it's not so much because, um, uh, unlike, say, um, what we call um, <clears throat> Um, um, uh, an effect that triggers because some lead firm has crashed, but more because of the of the of the contraction um, um, that's taking place as a consequence of relative rise in interest rates facing the banks over what they get from um, their treasury um, bonds, as well as the fact that those guys who borrowed money, a lot of them are out of business, not being able to service those loans. Now this is this is um, um, uh, I took a long uh, this thing, but uh, I suppose 
when the World Bank comes up with um, with the statistics for 2022, you, you one can extend this further, um, this until 2020. But you can see inflation rates until 2020 were trending um, to, a, to a lower rate, um, regardless of whether the, the level of income the country has got. Uh, next, next slide, please. This is the situation of unemployment levels by um, 29 to 20. We had this sudden uh, closing of the economy, uh, lockdowns that led to sharp rise in unemployment rates. Um, that's that's from 2020. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Now let's let's look at the um, economic impact on Malaysia. Uh, we focus on the impact of economic sanctions on Russia to on two critical macroeconomic variables in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia faced low inflation. But let me also mention to you that if there are questions on geopolitical developments and so on, even though it stretches across disciplinary boundaries to, to involve international relations and political science, I have no problem trying to deal with it. I, I, I welcome even questions along those lines. I'm sure we're all aware that um, the attempt to contain China starts from Obama itself as president of the US, and then it's continued and, and, and it manifested in much more clear uh, marked responses uh, uh, when Trump not only imposed quotas on certain things, but also imposed um, race tariffs on uh, imports from China, as well as imposed uh, controls on uh, Taiwanese semiconductor firms from supplying those high-tech firms like Huawei in, in China. Um, they, they, that, that's quite clear that these things were already happening. <clears throat> Um, in the case of Malaysia, it faced low inflation in 2020, owing to sharply fallen oil and gas prices, um, which also <coughs> mean that Petronas wasn't making a lot of money, but wasn't also uh, losing money through subsidies, uh, given even though the situation we have here, it, it, we have a system that completely doesn't make sense because we have lots of free riders here, um, um, including me as Penunggang Percuma. Uh, as well as um, um, uh, oil and gas uh, leaking out from from borders to to foreigners and and tourists who come here, things that you would not say in Norway, for example. <clears throat> However, unemployment rates rose in Malaysia in 2020, although it fell slightly in 2021. Economic sanctions imposed by the US and NATO are threatened to raise unemployment levels from 2023. Now, if you see this reaching, and these are all if and when these things happen. Um, you will obviously see a strangling of small businesses in the U.S., strangling of households because they are now caught with much higher interest rates compared to the time that they borrowed the interest rates. So their mortgages, they'll have problems doing it. Now, if they don't pay, it's not the state doesn't really pay it uh, in, as a substitute for them. What that actually means is that the financial sector then suddenly loses that much of liquidity. <clears throat> And that for, um, because it involves banks that have lent out that money, you will see one after another banks crashing. When that happens, obviously you're going to have unemployment going up. Um, starting with those businesses that went out because they can no longer handle the rising interest rates. Um, and then, of course, the fact that banks are also crashing down. <clears throat> now, you also have a food shortages and a fall in trade. Uh, which is already driving food inflation here in Malaysia. But we have to also know that um, Malaysia has had a net food trade imbalance that's been chronically in deficit from 1989. If you, if you go and look through the statistics that the stats department provides you from Dr. Uze, who I'm sure he got, would have got it from Madrid, you will see that we've had a chronic deficits with regards to food. We import all kinds of food materials, uh, not just eggs from India now, which has become quite, quite um, 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 a political statement for many, or a political football for many. But we have a, 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 a situation where we import 70% of the chilies, for example. Um, the highest time we had um, um, a self-sufficient rate uh, of for paddy, uh, for rice, for example, was in 1976, the last year, uh, Tuna passed on in, in that year. That was the highest we had for self-sufficiency. Uh, now, that, that's, that's in 1976, but today it's 69%. When in a country like Taiwan, which has got a population of almost 27 million, ours is 33.4 million, 
Now, they have 93% self-sufficiency rate. How did they manage to do that? Not just that, in all horticultural products that include vegetables, fruity vegetables, and also fruits, they have none that where they are relying more than 20% imports. It tells you something about what and how uh, countries respond to basic essentials. Um, um, and this, this is someone, uh, somewhat very concerning, even though there are, there are lots of talk about, about incentives being given. The last budget, for example, discussed quite a bit of it. But what I have not seen yet, um, I'm not part of the budget, even though I play some kind of a role uh, in an advisory capacity. But let me uh, mention that one of the big constraints, problems we face is we have had very often incentives and grants that are given. We may, and then we identify industries that we think are important, either they're strategic or because they're high tech, we need to do those things with regards to economic catch up. What we have not done, and this is not done at all, I must say, is that we don't have a roadmap where we have clear uh, uh, flag posts where, where there's uh, reviews to see if the goals that are meant for those who are getting those, enjoying those incentives or getting those grants are meeting those targets. We don't have that. Things that were implemented and enforced in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. This, this to me is, is a major anomaly because then how do you, how do you then continue to, um, to provide those incentives? Um, how do you then continue to provide those grants? Now, unless we do something there, we, we cannot possibly expect that the targets that we have set, the goals that we have set, will be met. And there are many, many cases where uh, I heard just now from, from uh, Professor Chandran, he, he make, was making the point that Malaysia is, is in the middle income trap. Unless we do that, I don't think we're going to escape from that. But it's not, it's not rocket science, though, to be able to do that. All we need to do is the political will to, to enforce these things. If, you are not, if a mistake was made because the selection was wrong, selection of the entrepreneur was wrong, you can uh, obviously remove the entrepreneur, which is what Park Chung Hee did you know, after the heavy and chemical industry program was launched in 1975. If you cannot meet the export targets defined by the government, you cannot enjoy this preferential rates given to chebuls, which indeed was the case. And if you had borrowed money because of those subsidized interest rates and you lent it in the black market out there at a higher rate to make money from the arbitrage differentials, you went to jail. There are clear evidence on that. We don't have those kinds of things here. If we had done that, it's very likely because it's only natural that, that governments can, can fail. But if they fail, they cannot continue to see that that set of incentives and that sort of um, uh, grants are sapped. They continue to dissipate rents from, from the economy in a direction that, that's not going to be productive. <clears throat> and this is a clear case because we not only abandon intensive small-scale farming. Um, uh, in the 80s, we suddenly became interested in agribusiness, large plant, uh, plantation agriculture, and we had this naive notion that, that we to be an industrialized country, the value added will be that much more, productivity will be that much more, we should move away from agriculture. No country has actually done that. Um, um, while the share of agriculture typically falls as countries develop, but the value added, meaning profits and wages, salaries, that share must rise. If it doesn't rise, I call it um, uh, some sort of a negative or premature contraction of agriculture. The share will fall, though, because when you have manufacturing ready and subsequently services, the same thing. I've written quite a bit on mature deindustrialization, because our value added in manufacturing fell. This is aggregate manufacturing from you know, statistics from the year 2000. It was in that day it was 28 percent. In 2020, it was 23 percent. It had contracted. While that of Korea and Taiwan are above 40 percent, that of the U.S. and Japan are above 50 percent. China is rising; it's over thirty percent now. Now, unless we can reverse check those things, I think we our our initiative to appropriate the synergies to to realize the potential we have. I keep re remaining an optimist that we have tremendous potential, but we have to realize that. And if things are not working, what we have to do something to see that, that those things happen. While several countries are expected to face stagflation, um, Malaysia is likely to enjoy further but slower GDP growth from 8.7% in 2022 
to between four to four point five percent. That's the that's the one that uh, our government is predicting, twenty twenty three. But um, um, and I think that could be achievable simply because we have decoupled from over reliance on the U.S. Um, when we faced the 2007, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, we had a huge contraction in 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 exports, um, um, largely because of the U.S. Now, very quickly from there, that is uh, 2009 till 2014, we have already decoupled that, and we our main exports then China was taking 30 percent. By then, it was taking 30 percent. Um, now that actually reduced our ketergantungan, our our dependence on 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 the U.S. And now that the U.S. is the one that is facing uh, an implosion uh, with all the banking, uh, the unraveling of the of the banks, uh, we need not worry too much, I believe, uh, as to what the external environment will be, so long as we keep uh, remaining cordial and and our relations with um, China, uh, and in, even possibly expanding into Russia takes place, <coughs> which are some of the reasons why India is now projected to grow at more than 6%, simply because it's it's got heavy uh, reliance um, on, on international trade from with, with Russia. Next slide, please. This is Malaysian inflation uh, and unemployment uh, from 1991 to 2020. Um, if you, the, the green uh, curve there, the green curve is about inflation, which obviously is somewhat um, volatile because it's up and down. You you also have, uh, but this is over the year rather than over the day. Uh, most of the time over the day is surely more important to track inflation rather than uh, a mean over the year. Um, but again, it tells you something. In 2010, we have a, 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 a deflationary it became. And then, of course, uh, at, at this moment, 2020, we we had a deflationary situation, but it became inflationary from 2021. Uh, although the, I don't have those, those figures up here, but that that's a, that's the situation. And then in 2022, and uh, by the by the end of um, uh, December, we have CPI going up and then coming relatively down. I think it was about 3.8 percent in December. It's likely to fall uh, a, a bit further. But food inflation threatens to remain high, uh, which is the main item that the B40 will be exposed to. Um, um, because house prices can be low in, in the peripheral areas of Malaysia, but it can be high in the Klang Valley. But the overall figure that eventually you will capture is that of the whole of Malaysia. It may not show up so much, but perhaps maybe we need to have a regional minimum wage uh, or localized minimum wage. I'm sorry, a localized um, um, minimum wage that takes account of inflation in particular locations. Something that you have in Indonesia. Overall wages in Indonesia are lower than Malaysia, but Jakarta is higher than KL, Kuala Lumpur. You have to. Just now, I also had this uh, discussion that simply implies that uh, uh, Indonesia is in a far lower position in the trajectory of technical change. Now, that's my main area of work. I think that that is likely to change very much. If you look at um, uh, startups that are engaged in um, innovative activities, uh, the new entrepreneurs that come out, not necessarily from the university, people with ideas and so on, the overall startups in terms of capitalization in the whole of South Asia over the entire period of 2022, Indonesia accounted for 70% of it. Malaysia only 5%. Singapore, 14%. Um, 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 Malaysia and Thailand are the same. 5% each. Vietnam is 4%. Perhaps that, that's the lowest that I saw in there. But it tells you something about what's happening in Indonesia. Um, uh, if we're going to have um, startups um, expanding much more, there's lots of interest, not just um, um, the startups on their own, but they themselves getting um, um, in, investments attracting, um, attracted from abroad. Including in uh, in um, um, Kalimantan, where Nusantara is, is evolving. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Economic exposure facing Malaysia. Let's. Let, I, I don't worry so much about whether we'll become uh, Sri Lanka or, or Pakistan. But not many people seem to know that Pakistan is also in the hands of the IMF. Uh, huge amount of the two big problems you face if you are going to have 
your balance of payment deficits as well as your debt service, external debt service that exceeds your international reserves, you are in trouble. That's, that's the exposure you'll be worried about. Not so much the debt in GDP, which is high in Malaysia, but most of it, 93% of it is denominated in the ringgit. Um, worst come worst, you can still print the ringgit. Obviously, it will be inflationary, but you still have a, a, a situation where you can't be held ransom by the creditors, unlike, say, what um, um, Sri Lanka and Pakistan is facing. And in that sense here, the reserves that we have exceed five months of imports, the reserves we have. So the, by the rule of thumb, if you have that much in, in relation to imports, you are relatively safe. Of course, then the next thing you look at is how much, ex, how exposed are you to external creditors, uh, which is part of the reason why Korea, um, a country that was developing very fast, faced a serious situation because the short-term debt plus the balance of payments had exceeded more than 290% of the international reserve before um, the financial crisis, Asian financial crisis struck in the case of Korea. And the same thing happened, uh, although the percentages are just slightly more than 100 for Indonesia, Th Thailand and Philippines. Malaysia was fortunate because I was only 60%. We still had, despite losing a whole lot of money, lots of capital flight, but still, we didn't have to go to IMF as the lender, lender of last resort. Now, the case of Sri Lanka and Pakistan, they have no choice because they just haven't got the money to service their debt, external debt. And to pay for their, in the case of Sri Lanka, even to pay for their essentials that they import, like oil and gas, for example. <clears throat> figure 6 shows the reserves in months of exports of Malaysia. Figure 7 shows the ringgit um, um, against the dollar. <clears throat> As with the rest of the world, economic sanctions on Russia primarily, and to some extent on China, will have a contagion effect on Malaysia soon. Um, as it is now, it hasn't really shown up so much, except that even China, a big export of fertilizers to Pakistan, Malaysia, and so on, has already lowered exports of, of fertilizers, which will have a bearing on, on uh, farm productivity. Hence, despite surging international reserves, Malaysia should do its utmost best to avoid a stagflation over 2023. That should also mean, uh, rather than just talking, but seeing that that farm productivity, not only that farms, we have about 2% arable land left, um, um, and the existing farms are reinvigorated, and to see that they are actually go going to step up productivity by, by especially digitalization. Uh, one needs to see it should not be one. I remember uh, visiting the uh, meeting. They were looking at whether the um, picking up firms that were ready to introduce IR 4.0. I don't think that's the right approach because we know what IR 4.0 can do. In Taiwan, uh, robots milk the cows, robots plow the field, robots pick up fruits. Our palm oil, which drops there and rots. In fact, I just may, may, um, uh, tried to connect Dream Edge with, uh, with the Ministry of um, uh, Ministry of um, Plantations and um, and um, Plantation Industries and Commodities to introduce what they could. They already have a prototype to develop this uh, crawling robots to harvest palm oil. I hope some, something happens there. Otherwise, you know, it's 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 funny because I've seen in Taiwan where where harvesting by robots using uh, robotic arms, where the robot moves around all these fruits and the mangoes are actually the the species they they. Have, grown there from Pakistan, very effortlessly the robot picks up all the harvest those fruits. Our palm oil is so hard that even the old system where we use um, um, gala to, to to choke the thing and the, and the entire um, um, plantain of, uh, of palm oil, which is huge, falls on the ground. And that too, we haven't um, uh, managed to find a way to, to harvest them. And it's incredible that um, um, that more things have to be done. It can be done. It should be done um, before uh, uh, um, we face further chronic inflation, especially food inflation. <clears throat> Nevertheless, because the statistics show that Malaysia enjoys strong external macroeconomic fundamentals, that's true. We don't have external pressure. I have to make that point clear. We don't have external pressure. The evidence shows that its external economy should remain positive over the rest of 2023. 
Um, it's difficult to predict because a lot of things are in a, a flux at the moment, and we don't know what um, um, each of these countries are likely to. Next, next slide, please. This is the total reserves, and you can see on the on the left hand side the y axis. It's it's gone up beyond five percent, especially because of exports are soaring to a large, to a certain extent because of the the. Um, U.S. containment of China, um, all sorts of restrictions imposed on China, so much so that we have lots of in investments in automated machine technology. We have semiconductors stepping up, exports, solar panels, and so on. That actually shows this up, but they are they could be trans trans transient though, because we are engaged in in certain niches. It's like we say we are in a, a sophisticated um, 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 export, like like say microprocessors from Intel, but we are not doing the r d and so on where the value added is that much higher unless we do that gdp is constituted by value added um, not gross output so what that actually means is that we may remain evolving horizontally rather than moving up um, uh, in, in per capita income terms um, per capita is actually value added divided, divided by the population remember that when the statistics come out if i'm not mistaken taiwan and korea would have exceeded overtaken japan Japan's per capita income. Singapore is over 70,000, similar to the US. Uh, Malaysia has remained something like 13 to 14,000 US. Now, I think we we have a lot more potential than to see those things stuck there. Let's go to the next figure, please. This, this is the exchange rates. Uh, um, fortunately, the, the rates, even though this comes to only 2020, the rates now look somewhat better. It has stabilized to a certain extent rather than one where we saw a trend fall in the ringgit against the Singapore dollar as well as the US dollar. And and even though the US is um, somewhat um, staying with relatively high Fed rates, Fed interest rates. The ne next slide, please. Okay, these are expected scenarios. Sustained rise in Fed, U.S. Fed rates and continued economic sanctions on Russia, if they maintain that. Rising interest rates, uh, not dates, the uh, rates will raise national savings in the U.S., uh, which will then result in a trend appreciation in the U.S. dollar against the world's other currencies because there will be less velocity of circulation. Um, but, of course, this means that Fed's position is about protecting the guys who... Uh, owning shares, the, uh, protecting the businesses and so on. Um, in, in because if, um, if real interest rates are measured by remove, uh, deducting, minusing uh, inflation from nominal interest rates. <clears throat> Bankruptcies will rise in the US as unemployment will rise with economic sanctions. Um, I mentioned this point just now. The contagion will result in a contraction in world trade, including affecting Malaysia. A lot of uh, to this the impact that we got in 2008, 2009 crisis. You can look at uh, these two books if you want to refresh your mind with regards to the 2007, 2008 crisis in the US, but we felt in 2008, 2009 um, by the book Free Fall by Stiglitz and the Return of the Depression Economy by Paul Krugman. Uh, now, the, the, the good thing that we have, just like all the East Asian countries, we learn from the Asian financial crisis and therefore, the banks uh, um, did not have much NPLs, um, uh, something that's rising in the U.S. now. <clears throat> food and oil and gas shortages shall remain, thereby driving inflation, especially food inflation, further up. Um, unless Malaysia seeks to reverse the worsening food trade imbalance since 89, ma'am. It's interesting because the 89 to 97, we had the ringgit rising against the dollar. Uh, many people thought the rising ringgit means that we have a, uh, an economy that's really strong. But we also should know that the flip side of it, we used to call economy mumbaham, overheating. It was overheating so much so we had uh, too much of power. Dem also, demand was far exceeding what the supply was providing, including IPPs uh, to supply power or infrastructure bottlenecks. Now, why did the ringgit go up? Now, if you don't have a capital account, then yes, the, the rise in the ringgit is reflected by your terms, your balance of uh, payments. But we had a capital account where lots of capital, both FDI and portfolio equity investment was coming from abroad. That actually made the ringgit strong. But while it made the ringgit strong, this is what we call Dutch disease. It actually damaged the food, food sector. Uh, it damaged the food sector so much. So imports from Indonesia 
from Thailand in particular, became that much cheaper. And therefore, we started the trend that we face now is a trend that started with that, but it got worse because of other reasons. The country will become more uh, further dependent on foods, uh, food imports. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. Expected scenarios, if, if the Fed cuts interest rates, which is what it did after Bernanke, when Bernanke resigned and returned to Princeton, and put an end to economic sanctions on Russia, not that you know they should not be warring with Russia, uh, but put an end to that. If the U.S. seeks to avoid a financial crisis, the type that when the U.S. imploded uh, earlier, and with that stagnation, the USD shall not soar against other currencies. So you do you possibly can, may not see because the U.S. is soaring because the interest rates are relatively high. Uh, and of course, people are saving money, putting in the bank, there's less velocity of circulation of that money. Such a route shall reduce bankruptcies in the US and shall lower systemic risks, including financial and trade, <clears throat> affecting other economies, including Malaysia. Economic recovery in the US shall drive similar recoveries across the world because um, this is the largest economy in the world. It surely will have a bearing, even though imports and exports uh, in the US against GDP, um, we're talking about GDP is about each one of them about 10%. If the US is largely um, um, insulated from the, uh, the global economy, and like us, our, us because in, value added is in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, um, GDP is in value added, imports and exports are in gross figures. So ours comes in that sense to about 200%. Um, Singapore's is even higher. But the US, um, it's among the lowest in that in that sort of sense, unless we're talking about close economies. <clears throat> Ending the economic sanctions shall return the global economy to normalization of markets so that supply chains regain their connectivity to remove shortages. Um, imagine if you just resume supplies of um, cooking oil from Ukraine and, and the US, I mean, and Russia, or for that matter, uh, wheat from Russia, and again, the supply of fertilizers that goes to produce wheat in the UK. Um, and then, of course, you resume the supply of oil and gas. Um, surely it will have a bearing. Um, but of course, um, um, I'm not saying that the, the Russians have the right to go and um, um, uh, invade, say, the Ukraine. I, I'm not, surely I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, although Jeffrey Sachs makes the point, uh, to some extent alluded by the, by the Pope, that the U U.S. stabilized, uh, uh, destabilized Russia by by precipitating the coup in 2014 that brought uh, Zelensky there. It's a bit like how Mossadegh was removed from Iran, or for that matter, um, 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 the various other regime change states that we have, <clears throat> or the destabilization of Afghanistan. E eventually, Afghanistan has gone back to its own, own, own past. <clears throat> Malaysia should still em embark on intensive farming and digitalization as well as um, digitization to solve its chronic food trade imbalance and with that food inflation. I will also include, since it goes in parallel and it's part of broad industrial policy rather than specific industrial policy, to have, um, I, I think the, the uh, Professor Chandra was talking about uh, carbon credit, uh, how we can green the economy. I also work in that sort of area. You might want to also see a book that I edited uh, last year, Financing Sustainability. <clears throat> um, um, that deals with those kinds of things now and uh, Professor Chandra has a, has a chapter there. Can I have uh, the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Yeah, these are the conclusions. Um, <clears throat> the impact of economic sanctions has left the economic future of most countries still grim. I have to say that we don't know what actions are going to take place. Suddenly we hear uh, Nord Stream um, uh, oil pipeline is bust and that's incriminating evidence against superpowers. I hope it doesn't go beyond that. And, and I, that's one second. I also hope that these kinds of a coal, the coal war is back again, that doesn't result into some explosions in our beloved country so that we don't we have normal life here. The unnecessary Ukraine, uh, Russia, Ukraine war, which has claimed large numbers of lives has indeed been a negative destruction. But the economic sanctions by the U.S. and its NATO allies have deepened the stagflation that emerged from 2021. I, I mean, we can't call it stagflation here, but the world by and large is facing that. 
with rising inflation and unemployment, the Malaysian national economy is not expected to achieve the bullish growth predictions others have made. From the 8.7% achieved in 2022, projections show a fall to 4.5%. It could still fall further down. But my own feeling is 4.5 is a reasonable um, uh, growth rate that could be achieved if only the, the, the budget that was announced by our uh, new prime minister uh, hits hits the ground and, and it's effect, uh, implemented um, effectively. <clears throat> However, because um, the International Reserve of Malaysia has continued to improve since 2020, um, in fact, we've recorded the, the highest reserves since a few decades, uh, um, starting from 2020. Uh, we had uh, um, um, the reverse of it before the Asian financial crisis. Um, and of course, we had uh, uh, serious imbalances with regards to even debt service in the 80s because we borrowed Japanese loan uh, in yen and then the yen just after the plaza accord the yen just soared in value and because we borrowed to build the north south highway the penang bridge and all sorts of things we had to service a fairly big big debt that was probably the highest time where our external debt against gdp i, I think that was the highest time <clears throat> the country shows strengthening of external macroeconomic fundamentals that will insulate it from externally driven crisis. Um, um, I, I believe it should be the case, unless, of course, we have uh, political chaos in Malaysia, uh, which may also explain why um, the, the FDI levels started falling during during uh, between eight, 2018. In fact, it started earlier and, and now, uh, uh, where Indonesia, among others, have recorded much higher FDI inflows. <clears throat> Malaysia shall definitely not suffer the fate of Sri Lanka and Pakistan lately. I've already explained why it's unlikely they'll fail because the two key indicators that I mentioned, the amount of international reserves we have from the surpluses through through um, export once imports are removed, as well as um, um, remittances and so on. Um, um, although there we don't really make that much of money from remittances from abroad, like unlike say Pakistan, I mean Philippines. But we have more than five months uh, reserves to pay for our imports, as well as the the seven percent of our debt that's denominated in foreign currencies. So that that part of it, I think, um, um, should not be a problem. I, I think I'm quite confident that that will remain for a while. Thank you. Do I have, I, oh, I have another one, sorry. <laughs> I just realized. Also, Malaysia has tightened its financial instruments and hence shall not face the external exposure as a foreign debt service and, and balance of payment deficits and burgeoning uh, non-performing loans. Um, the type South Korea and Philippines, Thailand and Indonesia encountered in 97, 98. We also had that, but except that we, we did our restructuring with the Dana Harta and Dana Modal to address these issues. <clears throat> a key issue Malaysia must address, though, is the need to raise self-sufficiency levels in essential goods, especially food, to check inflation affecting the poor. Efforts in that direction should also offer the opportunity to create jobs that can control unemployment. It is also pertinent to balance the returns enjoyed by capital and labor to check both absolute and relative poverty. Uh, if there are questions, I'll get back to right, why we should not allow Kersinjangan to get worse. Malaysia must improve institutional governance on stimulating sectoral upgrading from low and medium value-added industries to high value-added industries using rigorous performance-based instruments. This is something I feel is mandatory. There's no one has ever evaluated, and I've checked in my current role now, what has happened to the incentives and the grants that were given, whether the firms that got them performed. That focus should now include the absorption of new species of industries. Thank you. I'm sure this is the last slide. Thank you. Are you in charge now, Imran? Uh, yeah. No, OK. Thank you very much, Atuk, for your presentation. And I think we have a few questions. And uh, you did mention about the food 
uh, security issues and so on. And I think yeah. uh, we Malaysia imported about six point sixty three sixty five billion uh, worth of food in twenty twenty one. And uh, the recent shortage of uh, chicken eggs, chicken and high food prices have created awareness of food security in Malaysia and and hence food security has become a matter of grave concern. So the question now is, uh, is Malaysia facing a serious food security threat and what are the things that our policymaker need to consider and how do we as a country prepare for the looming food security crisis? Um, if you look at the budget that was presented by our Prime Minister, um, Kerja Jaminan Makanan is a very central pillar in the budget. Um, and, and a significant amount goes to that because it deals with not just the B40, but the essential goods that the, the country needs. Uh, and therefore, it's important. But my, my concern is more in terms of looking at why we allowed this to happen. Um, if you look at the 1970s, this is both Tun Abdul Raza as well as Tun Hussein On. There were clear policies to ensure it's not just about targeting rural development. We, in fact, I have done some work on driving development, revisiting Radak's role in Malaysia's economic progress. Not only that we adapted technologies that were relevant, and they were not the kind of technologies we have now, but it managed to meet the, the demand supply shortfalls, so much so that we managed to raise uh, rice self-sufficiency to 87% in 1976, then it falls. Now, likewise, in many other essential goods, um, the restructuring also meant connecting, building linkages. We had pharma, we had all these organizations that performed, because I know quite clearly, if you look at that book, the sort of interviews we did, the readings we made, it was quite clear that Radak, for example, was very concerned to ensure that productivity rose and that, that the affected, especially the poor, had access not just in supplying the produce uh, to the market with fair prices, but also to be able to access and enjoy um, that food. Now, in the 80s, we, especially by the mid 80s, we tended to abandon intensive small scale farming. One has to understand that food farming is different from large scale plantation agriculture. More often than not, it is used as what we call carpet farming, which means to say you may have bigger trees around, but you have food being grown in between, but you also have mixed farming where you introduce chickens, lamb, and, and, and say um, um, goats, and, goats and cows. Now, these are things that have been largely done a lot. If you can, the Taiwanese example to me is a great example because they actually knew the constraints Taiwan would face and they brought back agriculture, brought back manufacturing to Taiwan, uh, things that, that they outsource. Apart from earlier, they were only keeping designing and R&D in Taiwan. Uh, so much so services accounted for 77% of the GDP of, of, uh, of Taiwan. Now, I believe, I believe that there are initiatives now, but I hope it's not just initiatives that are by statements. <clears throat> let, let me give you a contrast. If you looked at a roadmap, technological catch-up roadmap in Taiwan, you would see the stepping up of the goal to make, say, 100% self-sufficiency, if you can achieve it. But we typically only aim at 95 to 97%. Um, now, if you because we also uh, import things, even though we may be a net exporter, uh, we also import at the same time. Now, <coughs> because of the the kind of demand patterns you might have. Now, once you have that, you, you establish a trajectory to catch up, you then must see that that percentage self-sufficiency, kecukupan, actually rises to meet that target. Now, if it's not getting there, you have to review to see what, what's happening. Why, why aren't we getting there? Now, that kind of an exercise is key. Uh, it's a bit like the, the midterm review plans we had during the Malaysia, Rancangan Malaysia, Pertama, kedua, ketiga, and so on. The midterm review then were more profound than what we have been doing of late. Um, um, 
and even the 80s we had that but not not after we need to make sure these things are done a plan where you do effective selection monitoring to see that these targets are being met so that you achieve the goals of that much of self-sufficiency and appraisal to see that anything that needs to be redone or, or personnel need to be removed replaced or personnel need to be trained or new kinds of um, 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 uh, products or services need to be introduced all that has to be done which happened in the 70s which happened in the 70s even though we relied on uh, uh, double copying technology from iri manila uh, the the malinja masuri and so on that we had bahagia those days now these are uh, hybrid um, uh, double cropping things that originally were, were borrowed and adapted now we have our own capacity to create uh, i think we should be able to do it so my own feeling is this is the time to really reverse the increasing reliance on imports uh, of essential goods okay but 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 to, uh we know that we uh moving into aging population and we have a uh, issue with the youth em uh, employment where unemployment in the youth uh, is about 11.5 percent and i think uh, we have uh, the situation where young graduates prefer to work within the gig economy and uh, when we talk about this advancement in technologies in agriculture and other sectors do you think that uh, for example we're talking about uh, uh, technology advancement in uh, agriculture and food industries and so on do you think that with uh, this uh, situation where youth are reluctant to be in the actual or what we call it actual employment and prefer to be in the gig uh, economy will that have a big impact on our sustains, uh, sustainers in the uh, producing the food uh, and the agriculture? Um, uh, it's a good question because I'm, I'm sure lots of people are concerned about this issue about um, dangerous, dirty and demeaning industries. Um, not just um, agriculture, but say uh, getting into coal mining or cement making because of the, the dust that causes brown lung disease and so on and so forth. But if you really understand AI in the way it has evolved, it's not just about automation. IR 4.0 is transference of artificial intelligence in those equipment, in those robots or in those drones. Now, a farmer doesn't have to be in the farm. Um, you can just uh, you can have a, a program robot that wakes up by itself with a timer and so on, handles everything. You don't need to have a person sitting there. Now, I myself uh, have done for the UNIDO lots of projects all over the world. I was once in Puerto Montt in Chile um, looking at salmon farming. Now, the, the, the entire lab that they have largely to test various different kinds of food sometimes for them to, uh, to also test um, uh, different salinity levels of water and a whole range of things. They have only these two guys some, often flying from San Diego, University. Uh, university Cita de Chile. They fly two hours to get to Puerto Montt from Santiago and to only look at things, then they go back. The rest of the time, things are handled by the robots. So you, I'm looking at a situation where the farmer is not there dirtying his or her, her hand. In fact, that's what, um, uh, if you look at Kamaru, the uh, owns this company, um, Aerodyne. I'm not sure if you're aware of Aerodyne. I, the other day, I was in, uh, introducing them to, to see what he could do to the farmers in under Rizda and, and Felda. <clears throat> now, he's looking at turning these di uh, dangerous, dirty, and demeaning industries. Demeaning means you know you don't you're facing alienation. You don't really know what your creativity is there into appreciable, admirable. The three A's, and he can actually give you a, a, a movie, a short documentary to to show that. Now, I think in addition to to the hardware aspects of things that you have to do, there needs to be the software aspects too. Uh, uh, you need to uh, create awareness, bring them around. That's, that's why I was saying that you can't just see whether a farm, a small farmer 
or a small firm is ready to embrace IR 4.0 because we know how it's been used in Israel, in, in Taiwan, in China, even in China uh, and many other countries, that it is important for them. We just have to bring it to them. And that is not just about bringing and passing them all these technologies, but also creating the awareness for them to have a feel of it. Then they themselves can participate willingly uh, these things have to be done. It has to go together, both the soft as well as the hard aspects of technology. Okay, but uh, we have we have a question asking whether what are the incentives for companies to adopt uh, technologies when they actually can get cheaper labor with much lower cost, at least in the short term. <laughs> then you don't grow. <laughs> Let's just look at this idea of, uh, of the palm oil fruits that are rotting. Um, it's not just about, and, and Indonesia is growing rapidly now, um, um, faster than, say, in the last couple of years. And, and earlier we had also the notion that we have uh, more R&D personnel here. I, I don't think that statistics is right. Um, um, the, in, in relation to firms, in relation to population size, yes, because Indonesia has got about 273 million. Now, and, and most of them in outlying parts of Indonesia. Now, in the case of Malaysia, <clears throat> if one is concerned about that, how do you motivate them to adopt? You have to actually show it to them. Uh, I, for example, uh, I'm in the advisory, I'm not sure whether I'm still there with this COVID. Um, um, Muhammad Ali Jinnah University, I, I was telling these guys that you can't get SMEs into your classrooms to teach them um, modern management skills to equip all the small scale farmers, I mean, uh, um, uh, manufacturers to enjoy personnel management, how to keep cash flow accounts, the many things. I told them to use this um, IR 4.0, connect them and not the way some of our classes are run, in ways where they have real time connection with that. It became a hit for them. It's, it's how you bring it to that. It's just like the, one of the things that the Taiwanese did is that the the bio research institutes in Tainan, they were able to get the government to offer the farmers that much of money for every kilo of rice give, um, uh, they produce, that they supply, but using the seeds that they provide, the technologies that they provide, but it's all upfront. The first round has to be upfront and therefore it the costs were underwritten uh, and therefore it was relatively easy to the point of rice self sufficiency rates in, uh, in how was it, 69%. I believe this done accordingly were into technologies. Um, I'm also in the advisory board of University Malaya's IR Center, and we don't is they wait for people to come here. Yeah. I have always been telling you have to go to them. Um, if you wait for people to come, then and, until the cows come home, nothing will happen. Okay, uh, that's, that's a question from uh, Dr. Yasmin from PMB. Question is, what is the future of globalization in the world with the war in Ukraine, which sees Russia and China forming their own economic bloc and the impending war between China and Taiwan, which is expected to drag the US and Japan as early as 2025? Well, if you want a one word answer, it's very scary. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. And then we have this uh, situation where the Indo-Pacific uh, um, a poll is emerging with the U.S. taking the lead with, with Britain, India, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Taiwan, and J Japan, and Korea in that block to contain um, um, China. <clears throat> then you have um, uh, the other one is gone beyond just Russia and China. We, we, it's under the rubric of BRICS, where Brazil under Lula, Lula uh, back as president of, of Brazil. <coughs> And then we have uh, Russia, China, um, India, China, and South Africa. They are now working on um, financial instruments, uh, transactions to move money around because they no longer have 
especially Russia and in, 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 in China have access to to Iban and all these uh, different uh, modes of financial transactions. So, uh, I mean, what it means is that we might return to the Cold War period, but with more sophisticated technology. And I'm, I, I don't think a world war will take place because I think today the Pentagon has already acknowledged that the Russians have, have fighters that cannot be uh, um, neutralized by the Patriot missiles. Uh, uh, with that in mind, I'm, I don't think there will be an attempt to preempt and start bombing the day to say the way they did with Iraq. Um, uh, my own feeling is they may not go that far, but I feel that they will. It would lead to concentrations of, uh, of, of blocks that might mean that those blocks have interactions within themselves, but not really across each other. Uh, I'm not sure whether Russia would re react because um, uh, Semo has made this point that and produce incriminating evidence about the U.S. involved in the bombing of the Nord Stream um, um, pipeline, oil pipeline connecting Germany and Russia. It's on Swedish territory, but the Swedish response has not been convincing enough for us to uh, preempt um, or exclude that that sort of uh, perception. And, and that's the position that Jeffrey Sachs used when, when reporting to the U.N. Uh, I happen to be a friend of the Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, what, whatever things he does, he sends copies to me. His wife, actually, Lida Sachs. Now, what I, I want, wanted to mention further is it's it's not good for the world. Uh, it's not good for the world to have all these blocks around. We go back to the Cold War of the past. Um, my own feeling is to end that sort of years, we, we destabilize. We saw how um, um, Mossadegh was removed from Iran. We saw, and there's no one now tells that uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein had all these weapons of mass destruction, but that was the, the, the excuse pretext that was used for, for that destruction. So I don't know, so long as we don't move towards collective responsibility. Um, um, in fact, this is being the term that I'd like to promote. Uh, we had a constructive engagement when Surin Pitsuwan was the foreign minister of Thailand. Uh, and then from uh, Anwar when he was finance minister too, flexible engagement. Um, I think we need to now work towards seeing what's good for them. trying to see where we need to stop and not, not the rest. I, and, and that also means that um, so long as we don't move away from that sort of scenario, uh, I think we continue to face systemic risk. We don't know what will happen because you may not know. Uh, it, it, in a way, it's not so much like the way, say, the U.S. Uh, pinpointed and uh, and killed uh, the Iran in general. Um, uh, for them, that's okay without declaring a war. Um, but my feeling is, unless these things are worked out, negotiated, diplomatic, don't really learn from the. Okay, uh, given that uh, I think the Russia-Ukraine war will continue and I don't think it will settle uh, this year. But uh, as we move on from the COVID uh, issues and as we open up our uh, economy, uh, but I think given the current issues uh, with the financial sectors where uh, we know that a uh, few banks in US have shut down and now with the Credit Suisse uh, issues. Uh, you think will there be contagious effect and will that have an impact on global growth? I think uh, it, will the global economy still on track for sustained growth recovery or uh, this uh, crisis will pull down uh, the global economy again? I, I mean, if you are taking that sort of vantage point, if the US is the country of focus, uh, we'll have to uh, see whether the, the the reactions of the people, because in the end, it can have a bearing in the way um, Reagan, for example, uh, ended up defeating 
Jimmy Carter um, in the in the elections that um, because he had this patriot suddenly sword of the housewives and so on having huge problems servicing the mortgages, it had a bearing on voting. So it, it could it could for, uh, mean that, uh, but until then, I'm not um, uh, particularly clear uh, whether whether um, these guys. But the, the actions in the past, the conduct shows that situations change. And in Carter against Reagan, uh, when, when situation was highly inflationary with interest rates rising, Volcker was the Fed chief at the time in the U.S. It had a real bearing in the way voting took place. Now it could have a bearing in the U.S. too, and they might suddenly end up in a, in a, a political change that might even mean that the Fed chief may may have to be changed, uh, which is typically the case when governments change. And and then maybe you, you may see something. Positive, except that this time around we have a real uh, a crisis because of the war between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Um, and effectively, I mean, the, the source that I look at is, uh, tells me that the, the, it's a war the Ukrainians can't win. Um, and I, I'm not sure why they're allowing so many innocent people to die there. But it's also surprising that the circumstances, um, the geopolitical circumstances have changed so much particularly because of the way liberals think, uh, because they are in power in many places, not what was the case before in the past. Now, it's, it's like, you know, Finland was, was attacked by Russia in 1939, but the fin Finns did not join NATO in 1939. And uh, Swedes didn't join NATO too, but they're all moving to NATO now. But if you look at the circumstances, when Gorbachev came to say the experiment had failed, he guaranteed, and it happened, the Warsaw Pact ended. The liberation of those uh, former Soviet Union territories took place. Those two things happened, um, um, but he did not see the same reaction from NATO. Instead, NATO expanded to, to annex those territories. Now, the reason I'm also emphasizing this is for the, grow, for the growth of the world economy, we are now looking at the possibility of those scenarios, except that now, as what um, the, the official from PNB raised just now, we have a different kind of a pact where it's not a Soviet bloc as such. We have China, in, India, and, and, China, and, and Russia on the one hand, and of course, Brazil and South Africa. They're all separated by huge, vast amounts of water and, and countries in between. <clears throat> but the good thing now, I'm not sure how long it will last, in the past, the U.S. never allowed any country to be on the fence, which are some of the reasons why Bunkarno, uh, Sukarno faced that problem, uh, although he was in support of non-aligned movement, but he was accused as a communist. And likewise, we have many other countries that fa face the same situation. But now, except for Singapore, the rest of the countries were condemning the war uh, in, um, in Ukraine. They have stayed away from from taking sides. They have not taken sides. Now, we have to now see how we managed to decouple, move away from reliance, heavy dependence on, on, on the US from the 2007 2008 global financial crisis, so that our exports to China, US fell to about 5% in the 2013. Now, we could, in that sense, because Malaysia is a relatively small country, it's Industrial structure is such that we can easily evolve around to adapt to changing circumstances. I am more confident about Malaysia than the global economy, though. You you mentioned our global economy. And unlike, say, in the past, our, all our Ranchanga Malaysia were written with a clear view that the world economy will have a serious barrier. Um, we have actually reduced that sort of, sort of defense with on, on the Western countries that, that we've done, and increasingly, it will become the case if they end up, say, unilaterally deciding that we don't export palm oil products to them. Even most of the palm oil is, I think, the third biggest ex export of Malaysia. Uh, so my own feeling is I'm, I, I remain fairly bullish about Malaysia, but not so much because the, I, I'm, I'm more bearish about the world economy. Okay. Uh... We, we have a question on uh, inflation, actually. We know that uh, our our inflation rate 
currently is about 3.7% uh, in January. And a question from uh, Mr. Tangaraj is uh, how reliable are our official inflation or CPI figures considering the experience and perception of the people on the ground is somewhat different? It, it's a good question, but it's not a, a, a question that actually reduces the credibility of our stats department. I think the stats department is doing a good job in producing uh, data that's, that's good, but we can actually have different kinds of uh, inflation measures. Um, for example, uh, a whole lot of people, not just myself, I still go to the wet market myself with my wife. Now, we get this perception that many uh, items facing rising prices indeed but we don't seem to know that the inflation we are measuring is across the country uh it's across it's across the country because the bundle of commodities that gets into the cpi basket and then food inflation just the items that constitute food now now in certain areas surely you feel um, but that to me more i would refer to as casual empiricism because you're facing that is this a nationwide thing to say you might end up actually having uh, different kinds of responses. But that question then should lead to more focused measures of inflation. Should we have inflation in particular uh, locations, uh, particular towns, rural areas, different states? You can actually do that if you, if you want to do that and give you a more accurate uh, situation about how households are facing, uh, especially so when the government, the government has actually even um, raised the, the hardcore poverty line, um, 2005 or six, uh, plus 600 um, at the moment because of difficulty is 2,500 rather than 1,169. Um, uh, that shows the concern that they have and what that money can actually buy. Um, uh, this is a bit like going back to to what uh, Phil Alston uh, once criticized the way we measure um, um, uh, poverty and not so much distribution because distribution is a relative measure, whichever way you measure you unless you're uh, differentiating between uh, uh, measuring uh, the Palma ratio, which is the top 10% divided by the bottom 40%, or for example, you go to the Rothschild index or concentration index. If you're just going to compute Gini coefficient, you will get the same measure, uh, same index or, uh, coefficient uh, once it's done. But what, <clears throat> what I, I, I'd like to um, um, uh, mention here is, all these initiatives should lead to more measures, more statistics that may be useful. Um, not so, much, and, and now we know that we are more alienated. We are unlike in the past. I remember most poverty specialists say that that poverty data, household data, was never shared at the time, and therefore we don't really know whether the government is giving us the right sort of statistics. But now I think a lot of it is shared. So you can you can actually um, um, uh, accept that they give you a certain percentage based on the sampling frame. But still, you have access to uh, quite a bit of data now compared to what you had, say, the 80s or 90s. Now, so my my own my own feeling is that it's a good question. It in fact raises a lots of uh, important implications to draw from uh, draw about, and in this sense here, especially so when the government is showing lots of seriousness to address poverty, particularly hardcore poverty, that could lead to starvation, um, uh, and they are even including family size. Household size, right? um, meaning if you are, uh, poor households tend to be having bigger numbers, they are more children, they are even adjusting for that. So my, my feeling is that's not um, ter terribly, uh, uh, terrible, and I mean, discrepancies there, except that we may need more indices reflecting more things. And then even within food, we may want to give higher priority to some over the others. Uh, but in the, even so, rice, for example, you see, we still have not remove the cumbersome and um, and um, uh, um, problematic subsidy system that we have. Uh, last year, for example, in 2022, the, the subsidies borne by the government exceeded 78 billion uh, ringgit, 78 billion. 75% of them were not enjoyed by the people targeted for. Only 25% went to them. The rest went to all these Punungang Prachuma, like myself, uh, in, uh, the foreign tourists who come here, and a whole lot of it leaked out. Um, diesel, the Ron 95 leaked out through borders. Now that's 75%. Now you have to make sure those things don't happen. And you can actually use that in different ways to, to 
to allocate resources to allocate the provision of that subsidy in ways where where you can actually have uh, uh, these people who are facing higher prices um, can neutralize the the, the price rise um, my own feeling is that's one of the things i'm planning to work on but uh, we have not really started the task forces and so on to deal with issues like that but we need to do away with that either we use rebates or some voucher system as it's done in norway so that we don't have um, um, that sort of seepage that sort of leakage okay uh when you did mention about subsidies and i think uh the nation expect uh, some uh, initiation during in the budget 2023 on the subsidy rationalization but we did not see a lot from there and i think uh what we what we heard is about the prices of chicken and eggs will be floated by july and other 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 than that we have not uh, heard much about subsidy rationalization so uh do you think when will the government start with the subsidy rationalization uh, initiative to is to help the b40s and uh, reduce the subsidy uh, that the, uh, the uh, the countries like you mentioned we 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 subsidize about 78 billion last year so uh, are there any plan to reduce it and uh, introduce the subsidy rational, subsidy rationalization initiative uh, uh, maybe in the second half of the year or next year uh, the, the first let me mention that i will start by saying that if i gave you a timing period if it and you end up getting right if i get it right it only be like what uh, 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 would be guessing but in terms of timing, I'm, I'm not um, one who could give you a date, but there are serious efforts by the finance ministry to see that subsidy to bersasa, that means it's targeted and it's meant for, say, a group of people and they get it and no one else. Um, that's that's one. So my own feeling is they are, they are working on it, but they are, it takes a while to do that. Uh, that is happening. So, um, 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 it's not... It, it has not manifested in the budget that was announced. No, they didn't have time to to get that far. The second one I think they should be, and I'm, I'm quite um, uh, adamant on it, is to see that the incentives and grants that have been given out, that it must be a clear scrutiny of that to see if the goals were met, um, uh, whether, or whether it's just a dissipation of things given to people who don't pay taxes because they've got an exemption, or don't pay tariffs because they've got an exemption. Now, these are all distortionary, unnecessary distortion. Sometimes we have to do that in order to guide um, the allocation of resources for if it, for noble reasons that that's fine. But in this case, they are all supposed to perform and we have not actually evaluated to see they perform. And my own understanding of it, um, uh, they are also a massive amount of money that has gone to grants and to uh, exemptions that we provided to certain individuals, certain sectors and so on. So that too, I think should happen then we'll become a more uh, cost-effective, more efficient economy. Yeah, I agree with that. Too, because I think uh, the first thing we have to uh, stop the leakages in uh, in giving out the subsidies and so on. So uh, I think there's nothing much more questions from the floor. So I think uh, we could and our presentation and we would like to thank you Dato again for a very commendable presentation and uh, sharing the knowledge with us so uh, if you have any more questions maybe we can uh, email you sure and get, okay. yeah. get question uh, answers from uh, Dato and also Prof Chandran and uh, that that's all for today and we would like to thank uh very much both of, the, uh, of our speakers and we hope that uh maybe we can have uh another uh event in in the near future and again thank you very much for our speakers and thank you for our participants thank you uh, imran thank you welcome
Yeah. Thank you, Imran. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.